Good day and good evening and welcome to Walk and Talk Tea Time with me, Kaito Chaiji, but you can just call me Kai. This time, so normally when we do tea time, what happens is I sit around somewhere in the game for like three plus hours and the entire stream is spent with me saying that I'll eventually get around to reviewing some clips. Uh, and then we just talk about something for the entire stream. Or that's at least how it uh, almost always ends up being, or we don't get to see that many clips. So we're going to do it a little bit differently. We had a lot of fun somewhat recently with a walking stream. So what we're going to do is I have a, a planned out route and you can already see the start of it up in the top there. Um, that's not the final destination. I'm trying to figure out what the longest walk would be without, you know, like just spiraling to make things take longer than they need to be. But we will be talking about whatever whatever you like while we do the walk then when we reach the destination that's when we review clips and then we see how long that takes <coughs> also thank you so much for the five gifted memberships Chester that's crazy thank you so much and thank you for celebrating six months of membership Matthew I really appreciate the support and also to the new members I hope you enjoy uh, enjoy the I hope you all enjoy the emotes and everything now before I forget <coughs> hey kids up hey you bust up hey Zaf hey Chester hey castle a self heal boonie and hey Warcraft travel and Vince I hope you're all doing very well <coughs> Right then, so what we found out kind of worked last time is I make a an alliance raid group privately, we put a little code on in here, And there. Huh? Weird. Uh, I think this should work. Self-heal Boonie says, I have a question. You think someone played through Final Fantasy XIV online without equipping gear? I mean, I'm assuming what you mean is remove all armor once they lock in and then just complete the game without wearing anything. Um, it is possible someone has played like that, but it is impossible that they actually, like, completed it by their own accomplishments. Because the amount of stat, like the percentage of stats you get from your gear compared to like your own stats, like just inherently, is massive. Like you only have like, like I think a tank at level 90 without any gear has like 8k HP or something. While with full gear you have, you know, over a, way over 100,000 now. And, as Archibasta mentioned, there's also item level requirements. Although, if you have a full party, I'm pretty sure that you can just go in anyway. But again, you will just be carried. That's how it works. It's not like someone can't... You can't do this without basically getting carried. <coughs> but interesting question. Also, hey, the Bad MC and Tristan and Irid. And Aradel and Girahin. And I think that's it. Hope you're all doing very well. Did I mention either it? Also either it. Can you do every solo duty without equipment? That is also a good point. Some of the max level I don't think you can beat the uh some of the endwalker ones. Also, uh, I made an alliance raid. The password is 3939. You can just find it in here. You can see that uh, I'm the owner and, every and everything, so you can join if you'd like to join me on the walk. Speaking of which, we should probably get started. So, we start the timer and we start walking. <coughs> yeah, you just join. You don't have to be in the party. If you want to, like, 
queue for something while you're walking, then you don't have to be in my group to join for the for the walk. And the reason why I'm a gatherer job, as I mentioned last time we did a walk, is that means that all mobs will ignore me, so I can walk without any worries. You can't do that if you don't have a max level gatherer, because the um, buff that ignores and it makes enemies ignore you only goes up to four levels above your actual level so if you're not like if you're level 85 then level 90 mobs will not ignore you and you will very quickly die if you're not ready for it and uh yeah you can see in the speed run timer up there the live split thing uh like you can see a little bit ahead where we'll be going which of course means that our destination right now is there um, that's pretty much it. Mm. Matthew says, I think some solo duties have item level requirements. I know that there are at least uh, that solo duties have sinking item levels, as in they push you down to a certain item level. I don't know if they actually have item level requirements to do them. As in, I, uh, that's to say, I don't know. But um, it wouldn't it wouldn't be too absurd if they don't. By the way, I already checked. I can't go this way. We have to go this way. Um. But um. We uh. It it would it would both make sense to have a minimum item level and also not have one. The reason to have one is of course to make sure that players that don't know better don't hop in and then fail because they didn't put on pants. On the other hand, it's a solo duty, so if you think you can do it in underpants, then, like, all the port all the power to you, right? Also, Chester, thank you so much, and I hope you have a good day. Mm, also, hey, Derby, and JS, or, uh, uh, Coacher. Yeah, hope you're doing well, and Traverse. Eh... Uh, I, I don't think it is possible to play through the entire game uh, without gear. I I don't think it's possible. Uh, some duties may be possible. For example, we discovered uh, a long time ago in the solo challenge stream series that a gunbreaker can solo like dungeons like Copperbell Mines while only wearing a weapon and a chest piece, pretty much. Uh while also at minimum item level. Where you're walking? Well, right now we're walking uh, towards uh, Dravanian Forelands. Um, it's probably not going to be a big surprise where we're finishing. Um, because I'm trying to make the, the walk long. But um, uh, there's no reason to just, uh, you know, sell the surprise immediately if there's anyone that don't know yet. Eh, uh, Coach says, there's a new raider. I know I have to check fight guides, but there are so many fights in the game. Is there any non-endwalker fight that are just not worth learning because no one runs them? Well, it depends. If you want to run a specific duty, it's possible to make a group. As in, there are people in just this small part of the general Final Fantasy XIV community, uh, which this small part we call the Kai community. There are people that specifically run old content at like minimum item level, for example, to make it more challenging. So there are people that run basically all content. So if you're going to do a difficult duty, Basically, if there is an extreme or savage label on it, if it's an ultimate, um, also specifically uh, the coils of Bahamut, uh, if you're trying to do content like that, synced, meaning you don't toggle this, then it might be good to watch a guide. Unless you have a group that are all in agreement that you're doing it blind, that like you don't l look up the guide beforehand. In which case it would of, if, of course be idiotic to re watch a guide because then you ruined it. Um, but there isn't exactly a fight that people just don't run. However, it is 
absolutely certain that the players, uh, the players that, like, th there's a much smaller amount of players that run the content that is non-Endwalker synced. Um, in terms of doing that content unsynced, even some Shadowbringers content may require... Oh, let me just uh, uh, unattach my camera a little bit here. Um, the unsynced fights in Shadowbringers, some of them still require you to respect some of the mechanics. Not all of them. But some of the mechanics. And sometimes just knowing what the mechanic is can make it easier. Um, so there's always a reason to watch a guide if you want to be sure. Um, although the older a fight is, the more likely it is that the guide options you have are outdated, uh, emphasizes mechanics you don't even see or don't matter anymore, or the newer guides uh, might not be as high quality. Like maybe it's some, you know, some smaller channel that is like mm, that's their one video or something they decided to make a guide and then they just didn't like build on that it's hard to say also yeah Girhin, this is a, a slow walk <laughs> let me just do this maybe maybe if i do this so i don't block the uh, party i hope i hope you can use that uh, answer coach here. Uh, also, hey, Kylan and Estes. Estes Soup! <laughs> and that is absolutely true, Estes Soup. There were people that struggled with the Vanar fight in Endwalker because of gear. Some people also extra, extra struggled because they forgot to take off the robe you're given. Um, also, hey, Gleaming. I hope you're doing well. Uh, what if it doesn't count when it happens? Uh, <laughs> that's a really nice one, Aradil. I really like that one. No more shall Kai's members sit idly with their teeth. <laughs> Henceforth they shall walk. <laughs> so hey, you got in. Hope you're doing well. And feel up. Um. Put on my robe and wizard's, wizard's hat. Uh, yeah, we, we're doing another walk. We're walking from a different place to see if we can go longer this time or shorter. Um, as, I, uh, as I said a little bit earlier, um, this is like a way to like make sure that we cover everything. Because what often happens is that I spend an undetermined time, amount of time just talking about whatever and normally we also want to watch clips on these streams and then I like spent 30 minutes at the end doing that or maybe 10 minutes because I spent the entire stream just talking but if we have a strict while we're walking we're talking when we reach the destination we watch clips then well I don't know how long this walk will be and this is the first time I'm doing it this way but I will have a better grasp on <clears throat> I'll have a better grasp on where to walk once we've t tested some limits um and maybe we'll be uh we'll look at clips a little bit longer um uh if if it takes way too long and hey Bronto, hope you're doing well Also, yeah, Matthew, there were people that equipped those ropes directly. For the most part, that doesn't matter much because most of the Elpis story is just talking, right? We're saying the longest was just over two hours so far, right? Yes, yeah, something like that. I'm not 100% sure because the longer one of the walks we did on April 1st did take significantly over two hours, but we wasted like 20 minutes on paths that didn't work and we actually didn't take the shortest path in Ultima Thule. 
Wasn't that four and a half hours? Oh, those were two walks. We finished the first one in under two hours, so I decided to do another walk. Um, so that we could grow even further. Also, I'm not 100% certain if there is a connection here. If there is, we'll jump down. Otherwise, I know this is a path. Hey, Mataro. Hope you're doing well. Xavier says, perhaps there's an audience for unsynced and counter guides. Ways to skip mechanics and things that may still kill you with Super Echo. It's possible. It's just that usually those guides ultimately boil down to, like... Um, a boss fight that is like 10 minutes long normally will be like 4 to 5 minutes or less unsynced. And most of the time, uh, that will mean that there's like one or two mechanics. So there's like not enough meat for a video. Like, it, like well, there, there is enough meat. You can just do like 2 minutes or something. I'm just testing if I can actually jump down here. Oh, nope. Well, then we're doing the long, uh, the long way around. Just had to check. Just had to check. I don't... I If if that... Like, just just keep in mind, if I could jump down here, that would be a time skip of... Then we wouldn't have to go all this way round. Just put a bunch of encounters into the same video? You could do that, but then it becomes difficult to sell the video. <laughs> There's solo guides that are unsynced, but that's the closest I've found to unsynced guides. Yeah, I've also seen videos where someone goes over what you need unsynced. Yeah, Selfie Booney says, Would you say you're a Final Fantasy XIV online speedrunner? No. The reason why this speedrun timer is so basic is because this is the second time I'm using it. Um, I just thought it was incredibly hilarious on April 1st to put a speedrun timer for a really slow walk. Also, hey Bob, hope you're doing well. Uh, and then, well, that's a pretty good way to, like, count the time when you're going somewhere. Actually, that's a good point. That might be... Well, can... Mm, I don't know. I think it's safer to take the road. Um... But yeah, exactly, Vince. It was, like, two hours. Uh, now, the question is because I... I have a suspicion that this is actually a longer path. All coils or all AR trials or all heavens for trials doesn't seem like that hard to sell. That's true, but the thing is, unsynced guides for these, um, for all ARR trials, the answer is just click your biggest attack. All mechanics are irrelevant. Just shoot the boss. Uh, so that takes like one minute. <laughs> There are no AR trials where it really matters. Um, for AR uh, coil, for all coils, I think maybe there are fights where there's a little bit more because you can't kill the boss fast enough. Curious, coach says, "Thank you for the response." What about Endwalker fights? I'm gonna start with extreme. Should I focus on certain ones? Uh, I mean. You can start like the the relevant the most uh, relevant one at the moment is abyssal fracture because that's the newest one. But if you want to do it for the sake of like the experience, you can start with like the top one. You just start with uh, with uh, the uh, the very first one. But it's going to be easier to find groups for abyssal fracture. Even if that's not easy, because there's not that many that might run it, I imagine it being the newest one might make it easy to find groups. There's also the possibility that it's equal because mount farming reasons. <coughs> and that's also true, Xavius. If read can be two minutes or ten seconds, depending on how you stack your opener. And of course, your opener is two attacks or something. Well, actually, it's usually one. Um, but yeah, you're, you're right. <clears throat> um, but yeah, do whichever one you like, Coach. Just keep in mind that there's a very good chance. Oh, look. It, it seems like Bob found a shorter path, after all. Um, 
but you can start with whichever one you like i do think that it's a very good very good choice to start your experience with harder content uh, on extremes because that is a little bit easier than doing savage immediately <clears throat> yeah exactly fat man that was exactly the one i was thinking about the um uh, nail fight where if you don't manage to kill nail just right you have a very long mandatory intermission and then you have only a few seconds before the boss will instead kill you Exactly, Esther Soup. Valerie says completely unrelated. But what do you like about math? Uh, what do you like about mathematics? So much respect for people who study maths. That stuff is gibberish to me. I like uh, crunching numbers. Um, to give an example of how I crunched numbers. Oops. See here. Um, back in uh, when I went to gymnasium. So that's like uh. That's like over 10 years ago, I believe. Uh, I was in a, a a raid group in World of Warcraft. Uh, oops, left here, I think. Um, and uh, I liked to just calculate things like probabilities, chances for stuff. Um, that was just like super fun like uh comparing things it is is it better to have this over that and like actually calculate it like back then you you, you could just use a tool to calculate what gear was the best oh then someone was confused there <laughs> um but uh it was interesting to understand why one or the other was better and math can help with that um there was a particular point when i was raiding uh we got to this boss, uh, which was a giant tyr tyrannosaur, uh, like a big T-Rex looking creature in the Siege of Orkrama raid. Um, and I believe it's called Fuck. On that boss, because I was raiding in a 10-man raid group, on that boss... The way it works is that the boss, like, uses an, an, a raid-wide attack that does damage and interrupts everyone. Uh, if they're casting anything at the moment when the cast finishes. Um, and the boss will use it slowly at first and then use it more and more and more and more and more and faster and faster and faster until it's basically impossible to actually cast anything. And while you could just bring a lot of DPS jobs that don't need to cast to attack, your healers just can't keep up with that eventually and the the fight switches to a different phase when in when a certain number of players is under a certain amount of health within a certain distance of each other so when you want the boss to switch phase you can just like clump up close uh, hug time and and then take the damage and then the boss changes phase but because the boss doesn't really have a mechanic that is worth tank switching for you don't need two tanks which means that in a 10-man raid team that means you're not bringing two tanks you're bringing one which means you have one free slot and the question then is do you make that a healer or a dps a balanced raid team in in world of warcraft 10-man back then was typically two tanks two to three healers and then dps for the rest um and the reason why it's two to three healers is of course because sometimes the fight had a little bit less healing necessary sometimes sometimes had a bit more you can notice that in final fantasy 14 because the group composition is even more strict than that they can assume that you have a certain amount of healing throughput guaranteed uh, which they can't exactly do the same in World of Warcraft. They can just make the damage and then just go, well, you need to survive this, and we know you can. Or we think you can, at least. Um, and 
on initially the way my raid group uh, went about it is that we went well obviously we make an additional dps instead of the tank so that we can kill the boss faster and i sat down and looked at some numbers and then i had a talk with my guild master uh, because he happened to know that it was pretty good with numbers um, he said what do you think um, we have like an estimate of how much DPS everyone was doing we know how much HP the boss has in total and we know approximately how much time we can stay in that first phase before the next phase starts I can explain the rest of the fight a little in a little bit but essentially how long you can stay in that first phase where the boss is just like bashing away at the tank and then interrupting everyone repeatedly uh, the, the longer you can stay in that the more damage you can do so the question was let's say hypothetically that we could replace a dps with an additional healer and then that of course means we lose a certain number of damage which we then estimated discussed a little bit if that means we can hold like x seconds longer does that mean a healer would be better and um, it was of course a little bit more complicated of a calculation than that and it was a little bit like vague calculations but it was calculations nonetheless and we came to the, to the discussion of would it be better if we had, I believe it was four healers instead of three? And, well, we had wiped a lot on that boss already when we came to this idea that maybe that would be better. And, um, I concluded, like, I then made the estimates and said, I do think it might be better if we had an additional healer after calculating these things, you know, with math. You could say in like a spreadsheet and when we then brought one more healer we finally beat the boss on the following raid night um and that's just one way you could use math for games but that was kind of what got me interested is that like it makes you easier to understand the numbers behind games um so i hope that kind of answers that valerie um I just like numbers and I like like uh, probabilities and statistics. Hey Merfolk, I hope you're doing well. Thank you so much for the five gifted memberships. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Oof, ouch, the floor. Oof. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the also, hey Bad Angel, I hope you're doing well. So, if, if for those that are curious about, like, because I basically, like, gave you, like, the first f minute or so of this, uh, of this entire boss fight, which is not a short fight, by the way, for those that are curious how it works, um, you can, of course, always just look up the fight. If you, if you look, uh, like, there's a possibility that you, like, you can fi find, like, a, like, an actual video of a full pull of that fight, um, but when you force that um, phase change, what happens instead is that the boss, I believe it chases the person that is furthest away from him, like until he reaches them. Like when he switches phase, he becomes angry and then he just chases someone and the one that he chases happens to be the person that is the furthest away. And he just locks onto them like a fixate, right? And as he chases, he'll go, uh, he'll go faster and faster and faster. Uh, certain things you can do. I can't actually remember exactly, partly because I only tanked the fight, which means that it was none of my business. Um, but there were things you could do to make him change the target he chased, I believe. So that you could, like, run him back and forth in this relatively long arena. And what you had to do while that happened was, of course, attack the boss. But then there would also come out, like, a jail guard that you had to, had to fight and the tank had to tank. And then the jail guard would like let out prisoners in the room which had like their own mechanics and they would also fight you because of course the enemy of my enemy is my friend uh, question mark um and uh when you kill so the guard no wait a minute 
The guard had to be killed because the guard came with a key. You use the key on the prison cell, which opens, like, lets out enemies. You kill those enemies, and then the boss just goes, Ooh, nice meal, and eats them instead. And then switches back to phase one. But now they have a new mechanic based on the mob that they ate, which of course means there are three prison cells, so you can choose which mechanic you add first, based on which order you deal with these ads in. And given that there are three prison cells, you can of course uh, uh, summarize, uh, summarize that the way the fight works is uh, interrupt AoE standing still fighting the boss until you can't then the chase uh, with like a uh, uh, scooby-doo music as you run back and forth to escape being eaten alive because you get instantly killed if the dinosaur reaches you um and then when you've killed a prison cell like a, a group of prison cell uh, enemies you switch back to the first phase until you can't anymore and then you do it again. And when you've done that, so you run out of prison cells, well, then if you actually put the boss back into the chase sequence, there's no way to stop him. It's not just, it's just, you have to run until he dies. Um, so often what you do is, uh, when you run out of prison cells, is you would go out of your way to avoid switching to the chase sequence again so you could just try and like it it was like a soft enrage you could say you had control over how long how long you could uh, stay in the first phase and given that you only got like four of them in total then it was somewhat important that you made the most of them also hey yimmy hope you're doing well uh, we're talking about a boss in World of Warcraft. It, I was using it, I was talking about an example of how I've used math to help myself in a raiding context because uh, Valerie asked, "What's so interesting about math?" Um. And yeah, Factorio is also a pretty good example of a game where you get a lot of uh, math stuff. No, 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 Xavius. Uh, I'm talking about Mists of Pandarius. Thuck from Siege of Orgrimmar, which has three prison cells, as opposed to, I believe, Violet Hold has, like, seven. Uh, Coach says, do you think it's possible for Square to still announce a new job for Dawn Trail? Nope. There is... So, anything's possible, but based on... Based on on the um on their like track record i'm willing to say there is no chance that they will announce a third job for um for uh for dawn trail out of the blue um but i do understand you however we also got a healer in endwalker so it would a little be a little bit surprising if we got another healer again that's not to say like Anything's possible. Again, we got a melee DPS in Endwalker, and we got a melee DPS. We get a melee DPS in Dawn Trail. So anything's possible. Highland says we're getting three jobs already. I mean, Beastmasters coming mid to late Dawn Trail. Are you sure, Vince? Because I couldn't find a way to actually do that drop. It didn't let me un like unless I was mounted. I'll say Oscar and Kasu. Hope you're doing well. Henry says I attend every class of Dr. Kai was the lecturer of applied mathematics and rating. I mean, that that is actually part of the reason why I made, like, for instance, the video where I went over the biggest hit in Final Fantasy XIV. Because that is a way to talk about math without, like, completely losing, uh, uh, losing, uh, the, uh, the, the plot. Vin says, there is one of you curl just past the bridge. Oh, well... <laughs> 
Oh, that would have been nice to know a little bit sooner. Oh well. It is a hard, it is hard to find some of these because sometimes there is like something that looks like a path, but there isn't one. And sometimes the, it looks like that's completely blocked off, but there is a path. So that like it's difficult. But it's fine. I am a little bit surprised. Like, e like I'm just saying, even if we had used te a shortcut to save ten minutes. 20 minutes to traverse churning mists would still be amazingly long. E Traverse says, I'd like another physical ranged. I agree. I was convinced we were getting a physical ranged that shared gear with Ninja, regardless of how weird that sounds. I was convinced that was, was what we were getting until they announced Viper. Yeah, also, hey, Cole. Hope you're doing well. Oh, there it is. Warcraft Traveler, the boss you're talking about, was that also, uh, was that also a thock? But that is pretty funny. What if the Warrior of Light didn't do cardio the stream? <laughs> Interesting. Twelve healers. I remember that my raid team, like my my guild master and raid like main raid leader, and when I say main raid raid leader, I was the second raid leader, which meant that if the main raid leader wasn't available or when we were doing farm sometimes, I would raid lead. Um, but the main raid leader and guild master was a priest, holy priest. Uh, no wait, discipline priest. Um, I think they were a priest healer at least. But specifically for Thok, they had a mostly, f like, pretty well-geared paladin to heal with. Specifically because Aura Mastery gave everyone near you interrupt immunity for, like, six seconds. Which was that good. Six seconds where you could spam heal without Thok interrupting you. Incredibly impactful. Mm, so I'll just have the raid die to Skiller in, in Circus. Wow. Also, Cole, I would love to have a ta a anything with a hammer job. I would also like a... Um, I'd like to see some more shields. I've heard that they have specifically toyed with the idea of a uh, dual shield job. But they can't get the offensive part of the job right. Which is why we haven't seen it yet. Kazu says, technically, they said they're reworking Astrologian. Again, that's basically like getting a new healer, maybe. <laughs> mm, kind of, bit, little bit-ish. That's also true, I mean, we're kind of getting a lot of new jobs. Bad Angel says, I like math until they start adding letters. The interesting thing with adding letters and symbols in math is that it basically works as placeholders, which means that instead of you calculating something for right now, and only right now, if the setup of that equation works for other things and it can be generalized, then you can replace the actual numbers with letters. Um, I think a way to get better acquainted with this kind of stuff is to see it in a situation where it makes more sense. Um, to take an example of this, um, my brother is perfectly good at numbers, but he's not that great, or at least he used to not be that great at, um, like, math questions. Because often, by the time the question actually lands at his feet, it has become so 
complicated in math that he doesn't quite like see where the um like what the um the question is which meant that i could solve the equation like ask uh, solve the math question he had for like an exam or something but if i explained to him in danish then he could do it himself like he did he com he totally understood what needed to be done it was just that because it was so like disconnected from the real world in some ways it was too difficult for him to like make that happen um and he isn't bad at numbers uh, not at all uh, he's a software developer uh, and he's way better at programming than I am. Uh, so, like, I think that's really the biggest thing in understanding this thing with, like, letters in math. Hmm... Vince, uh, you can you can put it on the. Are you in the? You are in the community Discord, right? You can you can put it in the general discussion. Then I'll see it in a moment. Um, Matthew says BSM, GSM, AM, lots of hammer jobs. Well, I would also argue that um, you could also say that White Mage and Black Mage and Summoner and Scholar are quote-unquote hammer jobs because they do blunt damage. Monk also does blunt damage. Um, oh. Yeah, that that would be a lot shorter. That that would have been a lot shorter. I completely missed that path. Can we can we fall down here? Nope. Thank you for sharing and checking, by the way. He says, I have a terrible idea. What is your terrible idea? Can we fall through here? Oh, we can! Excellent! My legs! <laughs> ow, 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 ow. And I do agree with that, Traverse, that there's a little too many melee jobs compared to the rest. Mm, Gleaming says, I'm a math tutor and I saw everything click when I used physical objects to represent numbers. Like, kids learn that you say remainder, blah, blah, but they didn't realize that's just the parts left over. Yeah, I learned math before. I, I learned, like, basic uh, addition and stuff before I started in school with my mom using, like... Siri is cereal and stuff like that. Um, the uh, the subtraction questions were of course the funniest because you know where the wh how they get subtracted. Um, Xavier says I work for the uh, government as a bureaucrat, and you'd be surprised at some of the wild math we wind up doing. Reciprocal percentages is a big one for contract negotiations. Oh boy. Can we go through there? Or do we have to go this way around? I think we have to go around. Does anyone know? Mm. 
And that's also true, Kazu. The reason why I don't count Warrior is because the that hammer will would still do slashing damage. Yeah, Alex says is this RP walk speed run through Heavensward areas? Hmm, it's more like we started in a Heavensward area. Um because we have a I have a suspicion that this might lead to one of the longest paths we can make. Um, but we will also go to some Endwalker areas. And we won't. We will also not be walking the entire way because uh, boats and airships are allowed. Emi says, my terrible idea is to be, be aware of the pipeline meme. <laughs> Leeming says, I think the way we teach math... It is doable. Okay, well then we can... I believe this is the shortest path, eh, or this. Um, way we teach teach math is just a little too abstract. I love math, and it's so sad seeing kids like no numbers, but have been taught to apply them to real things. Yeah. I agree. Where is the... Uh... Well, is it possible on the wall I'm approaching right now? It's the big question. Gazel says yes. <clears throat> Small southern gap. You truly have now become the end walker. That engine says, question, do you think the melee gear should stay as it is now? Sharing gear with another job, or should it be changed to all strength melee sharing gear? I think the way we have it is fine. Um, but I can see the benefits. Hey, James, thank you so much for the gifted membership. And I hope you're doing well. Thank you so much. He means says the terrible part of the idea is that I will have to fanta to get the images. Yeah, that doesn't sound great. <laughs> thank you, thank you for the five gifted memberships, Emir. Thank you so much. That's crazy. So many, so much generosity today. I really do appreciate it, everyone. Thank you. I'm assuming that the gap is up here. I hope there is wasn't one down there that I missed. Because it does look like it might be possible, but uh, it's hard to see on the map. Mm. But yeah, yeah, Bad Angel, it's complicated. I feel like... I feel like the... The quote-unquote fairness of there being so many melee DPS jobs is balanced out by... Um... By the fact that you can't use your melee gear for every job. You have to use it for like a select few. Whereas ranged physical and mage, there are fewer options in total. But at least they all... Sh and, and actually, to be fair, there's actually an interesting counterpoint to that, uh, Bad Angel. Um, at max level, the fact that mages share gear is completely irrelevant because black mage and red mage can't agree on what gear you want at all so you would you wouldn't actually want to, to use the same gear for those two jobs and summoner also has a pretty strict preference the reason why this isn't as much the case with melee jobs is because reaper and dragoon both are the kind of like ah, i don't care that much about speed um, I could have jumped down there as well. Oh, man. <laughs> well, I think it's mostly fine. We have to go over here anyway. <clears throat> but, yeah, thank you all for scouting ahead. Um, but aside from that, Reaper and Dragoon can use the same gear. There's a reasonable possibility that... 
uh, Ninja and Viper will also agree, because Ninja hates skill speed, so if Viper doesn't like skill speed that much, then they can use the same gear just fine. It's mostly Samurai and Monk where it becomes problematic, because Monk is super specific and Samurai is really specific, and incidentally, they can't agree. Not perfectly. Um, but it is a good, 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 good question. On terms as I graduated high school 10 years ago now, and when I decided to go back into school during 2020, I was scared if I had forgotten all of math. During it, I found out I was doing a lot of, of if-then true logic. Indeed, that's computer programming. And that's actually a really interesting point. When I started at university, the first semester, uh, I had, um, uh, like, logic, like, math logic as a course, and the interesting thing is that the uh, computer scientists, like computer scientist students, had the same course, as in the exact same course, except on their schedule it was called something else, like to, uh, to match with what they're doing. They had the exact same thing. Um, so we shared a course, it was just that the perspective was slightly different like, the way they went into it. <clears throat> um. By the peacock. <laughs> terrible, terrible idea. Remove monk weapon slot. Give them a de dedicated set of armor with dumb crazy stats to compensate. <laughs> Matthew says slow black mage for Shagir. The problem is that how slow is slow black mage, Matthew? How, how how slow is the amount of spell speed that the recommended slowest black mage would want? Is it like 800 spell speed? Something like that? 826. Yeah, so the slow the fastest a red mage wants to go is like 500 spell speed, I think, just off the top of my head, like around 248, so it's probably below 500. So, do I actually have to go? Oh, I can, I can do it here. So, you're 300 overshooting it, and the reason why that's a problem is because Black Mage is like... It's more about, well, if I have less, like, this is the amount of spell speed I need to do the tricks I want to do. Um, but having a bit more is no big deal. Having a bit less might be a problem, though. For Red Mage, it's like, if I have more than this, then Flesh and Contra 6 is just not going to line up very well. Matthew says that's about what a weapon gives plus food, and that is a very good point. I think, if I remember correctly, we talked about this a while back, and I think Cole actually put together an armor set for Castle that uh, could satisfy both, like, that could satisfy something like that. Not 100% sure, but I think we had looked at something like that. I can't remember if it was for Mage, but, like, the idea is there. Um, so it is possible. Part of the reason why it can become a problem is because if you're not savage raiding if you're not savage raiding then you run into the issue that well some credendum gear has spell speed on it and then your red mage gets really sad so hey cat Damon, hope you're doing well Yeah, exactly, Vince. It would. It was probably called something like that. Uh, part of the reason why I know that the computer scientists had the exact same course is because, um, well, so I went to university, right? Uh, I think there was over twice as many computer scientists as there were mathem mathematicians, like students. So when we had courses that were shared with the computer scientists, we needed a bigger room. So that was like the first sign. The second sign is that I taught in this course myself as a TA, teacher's assistant, years later. 
and I had a computer scientist uh, class at some point, if I remember correctly. No, wait a minute. That was engineer. That was engineers. It was an engineer class that I had that I taught in that course. That was a funny story, by the way. Uh, they only had put one TA to like help with exercises for 80 engineer students. But usually they didn't need more than that. But the reason why they usually didn't need more than that is because the majority of the engineer students wouldn't show up for the TA classes anyway. Um, <laughs> so for my first class with the engineers, I had 80. And then after that, I didn't. Like the, After that, I had like 20 every session. And the funny thing is, I asked one of them that always showed up, what's up with that? And he went, well... And the way the engineers do it is that, and maybe some of you can say, yes, it's not only in Denmark they do this. That would be pretty funny. The engineers show up for the first session to see whether the course seems to be really hard. And the way they go about it is if the course appears to be really hard, they, well, actually, if they discover that the course is really easy then they will not show up for future TA course uh, sessions because they don't need it. They'll just wing it at the exam. It'll be fine. And this is the funny part. If the, the session makes it seem like the course is really hard, then they will also not show up for the TA sessions because they won't get it anyway. So they'd rather just save that time and hope for the best when they get to the exam. <laughs> So, <laughs> so I, was, I was like a little bit like, so what's the rest of you? Oh, we just show up to every every class on our schedule. Like, oh, okay. Well, now 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 things are starting to add up, right? And yeah, exactly, uh, Bad Angel. The the problem with that is that the only options besides Savage and Credendum. It, like if you want to optimize your gear is like pentamil that crafted gear but in nearly all situations that credendum gear has to be mega bad like absolutely mega bad for it to if i remember correctly we actually have to go over here somewhere i believe it's like down this way maybe we can go over around this way i'm pretty sure we can go around this way um Uh, the problem is that most of the time, even though the Credendum gear has bad stats on them, most of the time, the primary attribute difference makes up for it. So that it's either equal or slightly better, even though the stats on it really, really mess you up and really suck. Like, for example, if you, before the relic weapons went to I, like, before you could actually uh, upgrade your relic weapons to 665, right? Back when the relic weapons capped at 645, um, the best you could do as a casual paladin was buy the sword, the credendum sword, the 650 credendum sword with skill speed on it because it had one more point of weapon damage which meant it was better but some people would rather use the relic weapon at 645 because they didn't want the skill speed ow Exactly, Warcraft Traveler. I was thinking of taking the bridge. I feel like that's the more scenic route. I hope I haven't already messed that up. I'm pretty sure we can, like, go this... This way, and then up. My folks say... Uh, oh, that's also true. If you pentameld crafted gear, then you can't... Then it's 640 and not 650. Which is a massively bigger problem. And in most cases, like the vast majority of cases, augmented crafted is better. 
there was a time in Stormblood where there were actually situations where pentamel that crafted was better. Uh, in particular, I remember that tanks would rather have regular crafted, um, regular crafted accessories because then you could pentamel strength materia on it. Then they removed strength materia. Also, fair enough, Cole. I couldn't exactly remember what it was that we, we had figured out, but I do believe that you did, like, prioritize some things with the uh, materia to help. In no way they do the same. <laughs> Yeah, engineering, like, the, 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 the thing is, the engineering students I had that showed up for every class were very nice. Not to say that the ones that didn't weren't nice, but they, uh, they of course didn't put nearly as much effort in. Like, they didn't, they didn't choose to work on that course instead of showing up to the classes, right? They were choosing to do some, do something completely different. Bruntum, I think Kylan might be your, your fellow Norman. Bad Angel says, from my experience, it's about a 0. 0.5 increase per item. 0. 0.5 what? <laughs> 0. 0.5 what? It is difficult because of the uh, 0.5 potatoes, 0.5 flaming banana spears. <laughs> ah, yes. The legendary flaming banana spear. Can you eat? Uh, actually, Ajibasta, can you eat the flaming banana spear? Is, is that like on the table? Is that an option? Coles has any idea why tank best in slot for top has tenacity on the relic? Don't hit a threshold with... Uh, Cole, because relic weapons can, uh, for tanks cannot choose direct hit. Um, end, uh, both Endwalker and Shadowbringer's relic weapons have a lot of direct freedom in choosing what stats they want on their weapon. But in both cases, you can only choose from... Four stats, regardless of what job you are. Now, the four stats are not identical between all the jobs. Because they're role-specific. For some reason... For some reason, they've decided that any time an item gives you a stat based on your role, then it gives you the role-specific stat. And tanks have tenacity, healers have piety, and for some reason, directed is considered the considered the DPS specific stat, even though it also works for tanks and healers. Uh, this also means, yes, that this ear these earrings give you directed and determination if you are a DPS. Uh, wait, which way are we going? <laughs> I think this works. But that is the reason, Cole. That is because um, the alternative is skill speed. Are any jobs not named Bard actually caring for Directed? Why, Bron Brontum, why would Bard care, specifically care about Directed more than other jobs? I, I don't quite understand that one, Brontum. Can you explain that to me? Did you jump? I did I did do some jumps, yes. Mm. 
Mofox's Monk at 194, so sluggish compared to 193. Depending on your latency, there is a possibility that it's because due to how you are, um, due to how frame, how the game interacts with frame rates, I believe if you play on, I can't remember if it was 60, 60 FPS, but because you can, like, if you click a button, even though you have like the spell queuing and all that, the game doesn't actually attempt to do the action before the next valid frame. And I believe on 60 FPS, there is a frame, like if you use a GCD, then like the GCD will start on the first possible frame, naturally. And then there will be a frame just before 1.93 seconds. And then the next one will actually will be right after 1.93 seconds. And the next frame after that will be right after 195 seconds, which means that 1.94 is a timestamp that is completely skipped. Um, if you play on, I believe it's 60 FPS. That's the reason why you're often recommended to go for, I believe it's 193. Um, in general, like if you don't know for sure, because then like you don't run into this problem. But basically, the this is very complicated. But the simple fact of the matter is, if you run into this problem, then it means that when you have a GZD of. Wait, how do we get up on the bridge? Should be fine up there, I guess, or something. Uh, when you have a GCD of 1.94, if you have the wrong frame rate, then you actually have a GCD of not 1.95. And there's nothing you can do about it except, like, change your frame rate. <laughs> also, hey, Zaku, hope you're doing well. Uh, Bronson says, no idea, just know it uses directed as a priority mode. Never made sense, made sense to me. I don't think that i think you've misunderstood something uh, the way that this works is that due to how determination and directed i talk about this in my video about directed and determination determination increases all output you do by a percent of course which means that it is just always good directed increases your chance to do 25 percent more damage right that also makes sense um, but direct hits, like rather, determination increases all damage you do, which means it increases the damage of your direct hits. Direct hit in gives you a chance to do more damage, which makes your determination more valuable. Which means that if you could choose between just having a lot of determination, or having a lot of direct hit, or having equal amounts of them, having equal amounts of them would actually be better. Like, not by much. Not by much. But it would be better. Because of how they interact with each other. Um, and... What this means... What makes this important is that determination is, like, point for point, like, 2% stronger than directed. And there's also no buffs in the... How do we get up there? Do I have to go over there? Thank you, Gazel. And sorry for being slow to respond. Um, uh, because determination is like 2% better. Oh, the bridge is over there. I thought I had to get higher up. Thank you, Gazel. What do you mean, Brontom? Bad songs buff direct hit. That, Brontom, would actually make direct hit worse for Bard. That would actually make it worse. Just a moment. Let's see. Chandler says, as an ex-WoW player, I want to play something similar to Unholy De De Death Knight or Feral Druid, but Dark Knight is a tank and I feel very uncomfortable tanking. Any advice? 
There is no job in Final Fantasy XIV that really maintains dots. The closest you get is that Bard, incidentally, Bard has two dots and because of their damage buffs and how they can maintain it, there is a benefit to dot snapshotting. You know, a core mechanic of Feral Druids. That's the closest you can get. But there isn't really a lot of focus on dots. For Unholy Death Knight, I'm actually not sure. And I don't think there's anything similar to that either. You could, like, if you feel like the game feels very slow, I've, I've heard a lot of uh, positives about people playing Black Mage when they come from a faster game. That mounts, might sound incredibly counterintuitive, but because Black Mage actually spends the full GCD casting, it doesn't feel like you're standing there doing nothing in between your GCDs. Um, so in regards to the direct hit thing, the reason why... Also, thank you, Cole. I will. I actually was thinking about that. That also answers the question. The reason why having inherent buffs to direct it is that, and we've talked about this on stream before, and I'm pretty sure you were there for that stream, Brontom. I'm pretty sure buffs that increase the chance of something increase it additively. I've also talked about this in my How Diminishing Returns Work video somewhat recently. They increase them additively. That means that when you use Battle Boys, you increase your chance to direct it by plus... Is it 20%? I believe it's 20%, isn't it? Is it 15 or 20%? And the 3% directed chance, which I believe is from... Yeah, 20%, which I believe is from Army's Payon, again, increases it by 3%, as in plus 3%. Which means that if you had 0% direct hit, you could make yourself have 20%. You can probably uh, understand why that would make direct hit the stat a little less valuable. If you can generate this, this possibility out of thin air, why would you care? This is actually the reason, part of the reason why, um, why uh, warriors back when direct hit chance didn't increase the damage of guaranteed direct hits. Before that, warriors went for zero direct hit because they didn't do anything for the attacks that actually mattered. The act attacks that actually mattered being those in inner release and things like inner chaos and things like that. That's also true, Bad Angel, that you wouldn't be using Army's Payon with Battle Boys, but it's more the principle that having things that buff direct hit actually would make you less interested in direct hit. However, on the grand scale of things, Determination and direct hit are like almost perfectly even Stevens on value, which is why the best thing you can do, just if you're just blindly trying to choose your stats, like, if you can, if you're savage raiding, if you're a savage raider, then you can just target best in slot and work your way to that. If you're not savage raiding, then you will reach a point where you have to go to understand what is good and what is bad to actually get a good set, because there might not actually be guides for you on what is actually good or bad. Um... Cole's bot also gets higher value from determination because dots can't hit direct it. They can direct it, Cole. Dots can direct it. I don't know where you heard that they can't direct it. Where did you hear that? What is it that can't direct it? Healing. Healing cannot direct it. You should watch more of the Final Fantasy Myth 14 Mythbusters series. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I covered this in like a in the, in episode nine, I think.
And your wildfire also can't, for some reason. Sage cannot direct hit their healing, but they can direct hit their damage. That means that if they direct hit uh, Dosis, then that has no bearing on what Cardia does, because Cardia is a separate action. It can separately crit from Dosis. In the same way that War using Blood Wedding and then like Overpower, each heal can separately crit. No, no, it's fine, Bronson. It's just some people don't actually understand these things, and it might be helpful to cover that. Um, so, Cole mentioned this a moment ago. The best in slot for Bard has like 1800 dissemination and 1300 directed. What you probably saw, Brontom, is you looked at the best in slot and saw that there's just direct hit melds on every piece that doesn't have crit. The reason for that is that the gear that you have access to just happens to have a huge amount of determination and because you want to even out determination and direct it to get the most value out of both you need to like you basically if your gear has more determination before you melt it then you want more direct hit melts if your gear has more direct hit like inherently then you want to do determination melts this also actually explains why tanks and healers have a tendency to like melt crit and if they can't melt crit, they melt directed. Because tank and healer gear never has directed on it, which means they always have less directed than determination, which automatically makes directed the better option. It's quite weird, but that is that is how this works. And Brontome, you're not the only one that has made this kind of conclusion. They look at the best in slot and then they think they know how it all works. The reason why, when you see a stat priority, which people use less and less because they can just look at a best in slot list, <coughs> is you will often see that it says crit greater than determination greater than or equal to direct it. And the reason is that if you have even amounts of both, then determination is 2% better. If you have less of either one, then they switch places. Um, <clears throat> Eric says, question on thoughts. Is there a chance for uh, direct hit each tick or does the direct hit occur on the application? Each individual hit can direct hit and crit. Every single individual tick. Which means that to get a maximum damage for a dot that lasts like 20 ticks, you need to roll direct hit and crit 20 times. That angel says, so if skill speed buffs dot damage like it says, how much of an increase is it actually? Is Army's pay on a 16% increase if it's 16% increased skill speed? Does Army's pay on actually increase your skill speed, bad angel? Or does it reduce the time of your GCD? Fox says, you need myth busting in Final Fantasy 14? Please let me direct you to one of the greatest, pinkest, and most smooth voiced YouTubers. Thank you so much. Chat out guys to chide you now for all your Final Fantasy 14 needs and more. <laughs> uh, Matthew says skill speed and spell speed are slightly worse for than debt than determination for buffing dots. We made it to a city and it took over an hour. Uh, they are indeed different, Bad Angel. That is actually the reason why Army's Payon specifies. It reduces... It basically... If it increased your skill speed by 16%, then it would... By the way, we're going, we're going for this point. Uh, if it increased your skill speed, then it wouldn't perfectly reduce your GCD by 16%. Because then it would be more like dividing your GCD by 1.16. Whereas what it actually does is it says minus 16%. <clears throat> and it doesn't affect your dots. Um, I'm not 100% sure on the skill speed, spell speed versus determination, but I do believe that they have weirder, uh, like, um, increments than determination. 
Uh, so it, it it sounds it sounds reasonable from what Matthew is saying. <clears throat> Eric says, "I was wondering whether snapshotting on the buffs affected the crit and directed." And they do. When you apply a dot or an effect that snapshots your current state, um, it takes it takes into consideration the entirety of your current state, which means that if you use uh, Storm Bite or and Caustic Bite or even Iron Jaws, while a Bard has used Devilment on you, you should expect to have 20% more crits and directives, even where after de Devilment ends, because it takes account for it all. It's just that the dots themselves should, and that's key here, should I forgot to split. Um, should have that extra chance. The reason why uh, I say yeah, when a when a dancer has used devilment on you, sorry, and also when has a da when would a dancer use devilment on a bard, right? Um, but the reason why I say should in this context is because due to it being a case of random chance. You would need to test this for a really long time to get a definitive answer. So that's why the best I can say is probably. One way you can test this, if you're curious and you have the time, is grab a healer job. <clears throat> exactly, Orkney, that is exactly where I'm going with this. Grab a healer. Make sure they have zero directed on their gear. Zero. Actually nothing on their gear. Which means it has to read exactly 400. That means zero percent for some reason. <coughs> then grab a dancer or a bard to give you devilment or battle voice. Apply buff. And then apply dot. If the dot direct hits after you have lost battle voice or devilment, then you have the answer. To Limsa. And now I'm guessing most of you can already see where I'm going. <laughs> Bulwark Hall. And yes, exactly, Eric. That is how, um, <coughs> that is exactly how, uh, dot snapshotting works is that it takes a snapshot of your state and your target state when it is used. There are some, uh, details here. Um, which is why we sometimes talk about um, glorified dots or equivalent to dots <clears throat> in the context of placed AOEs and pets. I've actually gone over and gone over and tested both of these things on the uh, on um, Final Fantasy XIV Mythbusters. I could imagine you saved uh, shaved off a few minutes, Vince, because. <laughs> I took a really weird route. Um, and yeah, exactly, that is the reason Iron Jaws is in the burst. That is actually why if you read like a Bard opener, you'll see that Iron Jaws is planned exactly when Raging Strikes and so on is going to end. Like right about. Uh, but... Wait, what was I talking about? Right, I tested both of these things uh, of the uh, glorified dots and that in Mythbusters. Uh, the reason why they're called like that is because a pet that you summon for 15 seconds that automatically attack your target and you have no impact on what it's doing are essentially observable like a dot, right? 
like, as Eric says, does that mean that Salted Earth and Living Shadow are basically dots? Indeed, the key word being basically dots, because they're explicitly not dots. Like, they're specifically, explicitly not dots. Um, and what that means is when you apply dia, like a bar, a, 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 bar, a, a, a white mage's dia to an enemy, it checks your state and the target state, which means that if you have, like, um, oh, oh, right, we're going to that sailor. If you have, um, like, divination from your uh, co-healer and the, uh, and now we go to old Charlian. And you have a tri uh, you have a Mox vulnerability debuff on your target. Then both of these things are snapshotted. Even if the Mox damage uh, damage increase ends or divination ends, Dia will do its full damage based on both of them being active the entire duration. That's how dots work. Placed AOEs take a snapshot of what you are doing when they're placed. As in your state. They don't take a snapshot of what the enemy is doing when they're placed. And they don't even take a snapshot when... Uh, hey! More friends! Hey, Vandal. Uh, they don't take a snapshot of the enemies from they are entered till they leave. They check the state of their target every tick. Now, you might be wondering why that is, and that is, of course, because when I put down Salted Earth, if it needed to snapshot the state of the enemies that enter, it would need to check every single enemy that could feasibly enter it in its full duration to see what state they are in when it is placed. Um... So that it knows that, oh, well, that per that enemy didn't have a damage reduction effect when I was placed, or that enemy did have a mug damage increase when I was placed. Um, which makes it uh, basically mean that placed AoEs um, check every tick. That's essentially it. But that's only on the enemy. That Angel says, so Battle Litany is better than Chain Strategy for someone like Dark Knight? Perhaps. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, maybe a little bit, yeah, I guess. And that, of course, leads us to pets. And again, I have ch I have demonstrated these on Mythbusters. Uh, pets scale with your state and the target state real time meaning that if you use living shadow and then the astrologian gives you a damage card and uses divination and yes also the damage card counts we tested this today then the living shadow will benefit from both of these effects even though the pet was summoned afterwards Um, and that's because pets scale real-time with everything on you and your target. And that's the real reason why we're talking about glorified dots. Because real dots take a snapshot of the entire battle state when they're placed. Placed AoEs only take a snapshot of your state when they're placed. And pets, they don't snapshot anything. They don't have any memory at all. They hardly remember when you summoned them. So dots are weird. <laughs> In conclusion, dots are weird. Cole says, so healers are basically dots. Please mitigate so I don't have the GCD heal. Repri reprisal is a DPS gain. That is actually... If... If... Reprisal means that you you don't... That your healer doesn't have to cast a healing spell, then yes. That is actually the general, like, logic of tanks 
using defensive cooldowns aggressively is that by saving your healer time, you're indirectly increasing your damage output. That is also actually, and this is something I talked about in my Tenacity is Bad video. The reason why Tenacity is bad under most circumstances, most being the keyword here, is because under most circumstances, Tenacity does not actually cause your healer to have additional GCDs to work with. And if it doesn't give them any additional GCDs to work with, to attack with, then it's not a DPS gain. And Tenacity, Tenacity itself is a DPS loss for the tank because they could have chosen crit. If they could have chosen crit, obviously. Or any other damage stat, and they could have chosen one of them usually. Also, hey Angel! <coughs> Hope you're doing well. Comes in form that Pagel really loves Bagel. Yeah, um, Monster Hunter, the reason why you often see Devil Joe and Basil uh, and the big Bagel, the Basil Goose, next to each other, is because they're both invader type monsters. Which means that they both are very likely to one show show up at any on any map at any time and two they seek out combat especially basil goose as far as i recall which means they're very likely to meet each other because they have the same types of triggers you could say <coughs> hey uzio hope you're doing well as well But yeah, that is um, Dots. <clears throat> Jesse says, but Paladin plus block chance with shield, ain't that tenacity based? Nope. <clears throat> nope. Not at all. I don't know where you would get that observation. Tenacity reduces damage taken. Paladins gain all the stats that interact with blocking all of them from block strength and block rate that is it it is everything and if you are using an up-to-date shield for the content you're doing then you have a 30 percent chance to block 20 percent damage sometimes when sinking down at specific uh, item level uh, or uh, specific item level intervals it can be like 29 percent or 31 percent and it can be 19% or 21% damage reduction. But the entirety of the blocking mechanic is in the shield itself. Tenacity does nothing with that. Nothing. And it has never done that. Ever. Tenacity has actually not been changed. But like, aside from its scaling, perhaps, since it was added in Stormblood. Before Stormblood, we didn't have Tenacity. We had Parry which increased your parry chance which was worse <laughs> go ahead Buzio. but hey, even still jesse even if paladin's block chance was related to tenacity that doesn't change anything. <laughs> like, you still wouldn't want that. Yeah, it's kind of, that's kind of true, Jess. It was actually kind of weird. Because... Back in the day... Back in the day... Uh, Paladins had a much greater selection of variety in shields. Like, some shields have more block strength, more some had more block rate. Usually it came with a lower value in the op opposite stat, which meant that if you got a shield with a really high block rate, then you had a way higher chance of blocking, but then you blocked way less damage. And the shields with a higher block strength, of course, blocked more damage when they blocked, but they didn't block nearly as often. Now, back then, the way Sheltron worked a long time ago was that it, it guaranteed that you blocked the next attack. That was what it did. Which, of course, means that you would think, oh, so I would only use a shield that can block more damage. Kind of. Um... 
in the old system, shield oath, your tank stance, uh, increased your oath gauge every time you blocked. Which meant that the shield with a higher block rate would generate oath gauge faster. And the shield that didn't block nearly as much would generate it much slower. Which meant you really, really had to pick and choose your moments to actually use Sheltron. Now, you also had an ability called Shield Swipe, that di which did some damage, and you could only use it after blocking, so obviously using a shield that blocked more often was a DPS gain by that logic, but I don't actually know if that was a real thing. Um, then they added Sword Oath. I don't remember if Sword Oath was in A Realm Reborn, but whenever it was added... At least in Stormblood, Sword Oath increased your Oath Gauge with your outer attacks, which of course meant you could just p pull up a big chunky shield and then just generate the Oath Gauge to block when you needed to. Because you don't care about getting a lot of blocks, you care about get blocking the right thing most of the time. Lucio says, me and my buddy are brand new to Palace of the Dead, and we just kind of wanted to know what classes you would recommend in 2024 for a duo trying to get to 140, 150 plus. Well, um, depends on what you like. In a, uh, it, it has been... It, it is true that it is possible to beat Palace of the Dead solo with any job. There's, of course, some that have it harder than others. Black Mage. Um, so it's possible with anything. With a duo, it would, of course, be half the effort for each. If you want to go super safe, it wouldn't be a bad idea to bring, like, a tank and a healer. If you bring a paladin, then paladin can use clemency on the healer if needed. If you bring, like, a scholar, then the scholar's pet can heal if something goes wrong and no one else can. But that is, of course, way slower than if you brought, like, a DPS and a tank, or a DPS and a healer, or two DPS even. So it comes down to what you need. It wouldn't be a bad idea if one of you can use a res. It wouldn't be a bad idea. But it, like, you can do whatever you like. If you feel more confident in your ability to play a specific job at level 60, mind you, then that might be preferable. <clears throat> like, my first long run in Palace of the Dead was a duo, and we went as, I believe, Paladin and Scholar. And I believe we wiped on a ho on floor 180. More and Red Mage? That could work, just keep in mind that Red Mage will not get Verres. More and Machinist Sage? Yeah, Summoner is also extremely strong. Uh, if you compare it to, for example, Machinist. Mm. Also, hey, Jiffy. Hope you're doing well. That's true, Bad Angel. Um... But, like, that, that's the thing. If you're choosing a mage, then black mage is out of the question if you're trying to go far. It just makes things harder. Um. If, um... And if you want to use a mage, then your choice is... Do you want a res and a job that is basically unstoppable in terms of mobility like you have like half a minute every minute where you can just cast while moving uh, or would you like red mage which has a heal instead both options are good depends on what you prefer Joel says cardia sounds kind of nuts and two man content yeah, both cardia and eos like scholar and sage are both pretty high up there there's also the comedy in that for the significant part of the leveling period of Palace of the Dead, well, a portion of the leveling period, Scholar will have its Art of Wars again on one. <laughs> <clears throat> but yeah, um, tenacity, just to go circle back to that a little bit, is a stat that is notorious for people thinking it is way better than it is. I've talked about this 
for example, in my video on that exact subject. Um, it's pretty funny. Um, and you can check this. You can check me on this if you like. But I kid you not, I've had people watch the video and then go down in the comments and go, but but still though, tenacity kind of good, you know? Um, just ignoring it. Like, just ignoring the observations. Now, Melo's here. If you haven't unlocked the lift, then I imagine you haven't unlocked the rest of the path. Unfortunately, I don't know. I hope you can come along for as long as you can. But, um... Yeah, the reason why tenacity bad is because... In, in short terms, tenacity is determination, but if I remember correctly, 40% worse. But the damage increase and healing increase that you get is also added as a linear damage reduction on you. That sounds amazing at a glance. Because that means that if you can get 10% tenacity, then you do 10% more damage, 10% more healing, and you take 10% less damage. Which means that every increment of tenacity is better than the last. You might recognize this from crit, and that's correct. It, it's actually also a factor in skill speed and spell speed, because skill speed and spell speed reduces your GCD every third increment, and the increments don't get, like, more distant. It's just that the increments are relatively slow, so you need an insane amount of speed before it really starts to go crazy. Um, so that usually doesn't come up. But technically... Like, the, the logic here might be easier to understand if you think about. If you go from a GCD of 2.5 to 2.4, then that increases the amount of attacks you can do per minute. Like, the amount of GCDs you can do per minute is increased by exactly one. Because you can do uh, um, uh, 24 GCDs in one minute on the base GCD. And you can do 25 if your GSD is 2.4. Oh, right, there's a staircase over here. Um, if you then go from 2.4 to 2.3, then you will be able to fit more than one full addition additional GSD per minute. Which, that alone should tell you everything you need, because that means that... Every time you remove like a tenth of a second from your GCD, the next increment will give you even more value and even more value. The problem is that by the time it reaches the breakpoint where skill speed becomes so good that it doesn't matter, that it doesn't scale as well as the other stats for like raw damage, you run out of stats. Like you can't reach the point where skill speed or spell speed starts to go crazy. Except for... Black Mage, where you can kind of, kind of, but then you have things like cast attacks, pulling it back in, and things like that. Um, and tenacity is the same, in that the concept of stacking tenacity is amazing. And I kid you not, when I started playing in Stormblood, I looked into like spreadsheets and calculations to figure out, is tenacity good? And I calculated all these things and discovered that if I stacked tenacity as much as I possibly could, then I would get, like, a permanent reprisal effect on me. Like, I basically just reduced all damage taken by 10%. That sounds great. But do you need that? Like, do you need that 10%? Because... You can get 30% damage reduction when you need it. Like, you can just get it when you need it. And it doesn't cost you damage output. Um, and again, the problem isn't so much like tenacity is great. The problem is that the other options are greater. Axel says in ultimates it sounds great. Again, the thing is that in a lot of these contexts, 
basically, in an ultimate, if you took 10% less damage, would that save anyone in your raid a defensive cooldown? Anyone. Because I'm almost confident the answer is no. And that's the thing, if you had invested those resources in damage instead, then I can guarantee you that it would save someone a few cooldowns. Tanks yes, others no. Are you saying that having reprisal on top of whatever other defensive cooldowns you would use for any major mechanic that will hit you specifically, like just an additional reprisal would actually save your defensive cooldown? Because, like, that's the thing, and that's when it starts to get complicated. And part of the reason why this kind of conversation becomes impossible to... Exactly, Axel. Tank busters is the time where the tank needs to take less damage. You still have to go, like, prep and just use, like, three cooldowns or something when a big mega, mega hit is coming your way. Tenacity or not. And if you have, like, if you're a warrior and you use Vengeance then you're already taking 30% less damage. If you then also have 10% tenacity, which by the way, 10% tenacity means that you have like over 2000 tenacity. It means that you have found every piece of gear in your gear set that, can, that has tenacity on it and melded tenacity wherever possible, which means that your crit stat is going to be in the dumpster by comparison. Um, then you get those 10%. And those 10% are actually only 7% if you're using Vengeance anyway, because there's only 70% of the damage left. Then you go from, you know, 70% to 63%, which is, you know, that might be nice, but the point is, do you also need that? Cold says, and it means you enrage everything. It is possible. Like, that's the thing. And the key thing that is very often forgotten when you compare... Um, when you compare tenacity to other stats, is that these other stats, except directed, also provide other things. Directed only makes you do more damage. It only makes you do more damage. Determination increases your healing done. And I'm like 90% certain that blood wedding, should we get like get down into like pedan like get really pedantic, will also benefit from this. Enjoy your meal, Milo. Uh, crit, crit increases your healing because you heal more when you crit. As in both you crit more and those crits heal more. Granted, that's random. You can't rely on that. But the more crit chance you have, the more you can rely on it. Like, if you have a full best in slot set for, like, a warrior, those four swings during Blood Wedding, on average, one of them will crit. And if you use Inner Chaos there, that one is guaranteed to crit, and that crit will heal for more because you have more crit. Vince is uh, so far, I think we found about 12 minutes skippable on the path at the moment, but still looks like it's at least as good. And the reverse seems almost definitely as long as calculated today. Fair enough. And this, that's actually a good point. In Churning Mists, there might be some spots. Actually, never mind. There may be some spots if we did this path in reverse where we wouldn't be able to jump down. Gamer says, and he will heal for even more since guaranteed crit scale harder with crit. Actually, not exactly. And I've actually also demonstrated that one on Final Fantasy XIV Mythbusters. Let's take that one, because that's actually another one that is a little complicated. Mildly complicated. And is an easy misunderstanding. Crits. Guaranteed crits scale harder with crit chance increasing buffs but not the crit stat itself you might be thinking why is that and you might also be thinking but direct hit and that's correct let's start with direct hit 
direct hit versus that increases your chance to direct hit and increases the power of things that are guaranteed to direct hit. It is actually stated in the tooltip for direct hit itself. It's like it's burned in. The reason for this is when you use a guaranteed direct hit, the direct hit stat becomes meaningless because it does nothing for you. So to make sure that direct hit doesn't like become worse because jobs are more like these days become more and more likely to have this kind of interaction where they have a guaranteed direct hit, they gave it this property where it just grabs the direct hit chance and just plants it on top of the direct hit damage itself. So if you have like 20% direct hit chance, then it on a guaranteed direct hit, it actually takes those 20% and say, well, you already do 25% more damage. Now you do 45% more damage. Some things to that effect. Um, it's a little hard to test, but that's where my estimates what I found out. Um, which of course makes direct hit really good. This addition made it so that warriors went from hating direct hit to liking it. Uh, crit, on the other hand, because the crit stat itself both increases the power and chance of critting, they don't want you to, like, triple dip on that by then also mashing them together when you have a guaranteed crit. It's a um, really weird one, because it seemed like it worked this way. You can also see in the crit tooltip that they don't state this... Uh, thing where they that it scales even harder if it's a guaranteed crit but and i do want to be really sure that i don't miss this one game on him if you put devilment on a character that is about to use guaranteed crit that crit chance that crit chance from a buff will be added on top of the base crit damage exactly because of the precisely same reason that i just explained for this for, for direct hit that if your crit is guaranteed, then additional crit chance becomes meaningless. Therefore, they add it on top. That, that's the idea. Mm, Kazu says, I'm kind of curious with this. Since tenacity is pretty much useless and pretty much every other substat is good in at least one application, does tenacity need a buff? The contexts in which tenacity is good, good, is the same kinds of conversations as piety being good. As in, if you need it, then it's good. The problem is that tenacity is a lot harder to measure when you need it or not. Wee! Welcoming party! Whether you need it or not. <clears throat> because piety has a very obvious case where you might need it. But even then, it's not. Like, when would you want more piety? You wipe on a boss because you ran out of MP. What do you do? First, you check, should I have used my cooldowns better? Could I have been more, like, resource efficient? Then you check, did I use all of my MP recovery options efficiently enough? And if you realize that you can't be more efficient with the MP and you are using all of the MP that you can have as efficiently as you can, then it starts to become, well, I need more piety. And that exactly means, as Mick says, it can be doing during prog. For tanks, if you're dying to a tank buster, the only time where you would be like, I need more tenacity is if the boss, like, killed you by, like, oh, if you just had taken, like, 3% less damage, then you could have stacked some tenacity to make it work. <clears throat> Ron Tom says, is piety not also good for proc when you don't know if you'll need more or less? possible but the key here is that usually you will it is better to lean towards less and then like sprinkle in more when you need it rather than the opposite 
in most cases when you're progging, it's not the first priority to have the healers go full blast on damage. And yes, exactly, game on him. That is, I, that I actually have a video on that subject. Uh, I believe I called it something like the damage dealing bottleneck. The reason why tanks and healers stack the damage dealing stats is because we've reached a point where we've discovered that defensive cooldowns are only only good when they're needed, but damage is always good. Um, like, what would be a good uh, way to explain that? Insurance is good when things go wrong, but having that money yourself to invest in something else is better every day, even when you don't need the, like, especially when you don't need the insurance. Rename your stream title, guy, to actually have a video about that. Well, I thought that was like a standard here. And yeah, exactly, Axel. I haven't actually watched that video where Joe Cat says that, but that is kind of the point I was making in the dam damage eating bottleneck. So give it a, in broad strokes. You know what would make tenacity great in Party Finder? If tenacity was actually an aura that either one, the more realistic one, reduced the damage everyone else took. Or option two, it was like an aura that makes everyone else smarter and better at dealing with mechanics. <laughs> that is, of course, the op impossible option. But the reason why that would make it better is because part of the reason why the damage dealing bottleneck is a thing is because killing the boss faster means that fewer mechanics will happen. You can only trust yourself to do the mechanics right. Hopefully. Um, but you can't trust anyone else. So why would you stack tenacity so that you take less damage? You need to help everyone else take less damage so they stop dying. And let's say, since dancers pair with another player, and Dragoons can buff another player, etc. Are there any classes that are really synergistic duos? Um... Mm, well, let's put it like this. Jobs with damage buffs. Hey, Ryan and Wool. I hope you're both doing well. Jobs with damage buffs typically do less damage themselves for balance reasons. Which means that jobs with damage buffs, especially ones they share, right? Specifically ones they share, are really good to pair with jobs that don't have any damage buffs. Uh, I kind of talk about this as the... Uh, the um, uh, anime protagonist effect or like the power of friendship samurai has no damage buffs which means samurai does an insane amount of dps personally black mage don't have any damage buffs so black mage does a crazy amount of damage personally so if you stack all of those damage buffs on the samurai or the black mage then they will amplify the value of those cooldowns better than any other dps could which means that if you bring a Dragoon and a Dancer, they are both buffing the Samurai or the Black Mage. And not each other, because that would be wasteful. Both of them have like two damage buffs, actually three damage buffs. Well, two for Dragoon and three for Dancer. So, like, that's the real synergy here, is that if you pair a job like Dancer with a job like Samurai, because Dancer is like a hyper-support job, and Samurai is what we sometimes t talk about as the... I, I've talked about this as a... Um, they're typically called selfish jobs. Um, and the concept of calling a job selfish makes no sense, because... Calling a job selfish in this context means this job does not have any 
damage increasing buffs they share with anyone else. That's what it means. Which means that Samurai is a selfish DPS. Black Mage is a selfish DPS. Sage and White Mage are selfish healers and all tanks are selfish because they don't have any raid buffs to share offensively. And defensive cooldowns don't count. They, 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 they don't matter. Who cares about that? We'll figure it out. Kazu says, what if the tanks had more consistent damage throughout the fight? I feel it could be a hard thing to balance, but could that affect the usefulness of tenacity? I'm guessing what you mean is, what if tanks took more consistent damage over the course of a fight? Yes, if tanks took more damage, like a lot more damage, um, then you might reach a point where if you had some tenacity, if you had some tenacity, then maybe you could save a few GCDs for the healers. And you can probably see where I'm going with this. For tenacity to be good because of the like consistent damage of an of a raid, then it actually means that the that you need the tanks to take so much damage that the healers are completely exhausted of cooldowns, and that white mage actually goes, I have to cast cure two now. I have to or the tank will die. Then tenacity starts to become good if enough tenacity can lead it to be a situation where the healer does not have to do that. Bad Angel says, I think in an all-out buff party, Dragoon might do more damage than a Samurai only because of the multiplicative stacking. Bad Angel, the way that it works, and you might have seen this on FF logs and then interpreted it weirdly, It's been a while since we've done this exercise. I need to make sure I don't run into a wall while I do this. So you see this, right? Sorry, I have to turn. You see Dragoon is up there at the top. Our DPS means when the Dragoon gives the Samurai Dragon Sight, then those 5% more damage Samurai is doing is being attributed to the Dragoon and not the Samurai, which means the Dragoon does more damage because of the Samurai. That's how jobs that have good rate buffs work. A DPS is the what, how much damage are you actually doing? That's what you would see on a DPS meter. Can you see the difference here? <laughs> Can you see the difference? <laughs> that's why Samurai and Black Mage. That's why Samurai and Black Mage. This is the difference. But technically, in a group, the combined contributions of a Dragoon is greater than the contributions of a Samurai because the things that Samurai contributes is I do a lot of damage, put buffs on me and I'll do more damage. The contributions that Dragoon makes is I make everyone do more damage. And if you credit the Dragoon for that, then the Dragoon actually was more impactful. Also, hey Dan and Legion, I'll be doing well. And Darth. But that, that is the thing, and then this is again a thing of like, if you look at the kind of data that like, the big math nerds throw around and they know what they're talking about, if you look at it and you don't quite get it, like entirely, then you can get the wrong idea. For example, well, Dragoon is higher on the meter, so Dragoon does more damage, right? But then there's more to it than that. <clears throat> Bad Angels, that's true. Maybe I just play with bad Samurais. Are you talking in a casual or savage raiding context, Bad Angel? <laughs> Good luck, Wool. 
Chandler says, so then would a full party of Dancer, Bard, etc. with like one Samurai be mathematically the best? Potentially. Bad Angel says, Savage, I'm usually top DPS in my party finder raids as Dragoon. Let me just fish out this uh, raid lock thing again. Just uh, to give a little bit more uh, sense to this. So, when you're saying I'm usually top DPS, I'm guessing you're talking about DPS meters. This line here is like the average performance of Samurais that have posted logs for Anabazayas, yeah? This is the bottom of the barrel. This is like the top top, right? Which means that an average Dragoon is still better than a significant portion of Samurai and a huge portion of Black Mages. So it is perfectly possible that you're top DPS because the Samurai and Black Mages you meet are not great. There's also the part that a lot of these, a significant portion of these locks are of course done with best in slot gear and you might not be in a group with full best in slot. To Chandler's question, another way we can look at this, and this is of course examples based on like actual data right for the first boss in the current raid tier the top performing group had a dark knight and a gunbreaker both of these tanks are known to be to be the best tanks at the uh, maximizing damage during raid buffs they can do slightly more than warrior and paladin slightly like we're talking single digit percent usually Astrologian and Scholar are the two selfless healers because they both have raid buffs. You can probably see that there's something right in your assumption. Ninja has a damage increasing raid buff in Mug. Increases damage done by 5% by everyone attacking the ninja's target. For a bit. Dancer, talked about, has like three buffs. Black Mage is selfish and Samurai is selfish. The reason why you might have both Samurai and Black Mage is because you want at least one Mage in your group because of party bonus, which is... Uh, oh, you can't see it here, but when you're in a party, you can see like a bonus here. It increases all things you do by 1%, basically, per role you have. And Mage is one of those roles. And basically, Summoner and Red Mage are here and Black Mage is here. So it's possible that simply having a really, really good Black Mage is slightly better than having an additional raid buff. Um. And you can, like, you can see this, that it's typical that you have, like, two jobs with a damage buff. But Black Mage is insanely strong right now. Like... It's insanely good right now. But ultimately what I'm getting at is that <clears throat> you're not entirely wrong with that assumption, Chandler, that stacking more damage buffs is good. Rontum says, is that current? That's the rank one performance. Like that's the actual current speed run rankings of those bosses. So yes, that is current. When did Red Mage outperform Summoner? Um. right now as you can see the reason why you might be confused by that brown tome I'll, I'll show you on the spreadsheet and just uh, on the on the logs again in just a moment by the way we can we can use the speed run through uh, the the uh, omicron teleports here you can see this line here brown tome you see this line that's the average uh, summoner this is the average red mage Summoner is considered the easiest DPS job to do well with of all the jobs, basically. So a very average summoner is better than an average red mage. And red mage is actually a job that is it is considered rather easy. But red mage is also one of the hardest jobs to optimize. Like, they're actually one of the hardest jobs to optimize in some specific ways which means that it can be hard because difficulty is subjective and the reason why red mage can be this hard to optimize is because 
with all the mechanics flying around your head, you have to make sure that Flesh and Contra 6 comes out on cooldown. You have to plan exactly when the best time to use things like your melee combo is, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's the reason. But Summoner apparently is not quite as capable of uh, reaching the same heights as Red Mage when you're doing really well. Um, and that's also true, Dan. Speedrunners are doing all sorts of shenanigans to maximize their damage. But it doesn't change the fact that while they're doing that kind of cheese, they're also trying to maximize like the actual damage of the group. Also, hey Coco, hope you're doing well. We're walking, and we're almost at our destination. Mm. But another thing that is also really important to keep in mind is that, and this is something that people also have a tendency to miss when they're looking at the logs, is that, and see, now, now I'm opening the logs for the 15th time because I keep going like, well, actually, there was one more thing. Well, actually, there's one more thing. Um, the difference between the worst summoner log in Anabazias. The worst Anabazias log in this log, in this uh, graph at least. The worst is a performance of 62, which is absolutely horrendous, right? The best performance of a black mage is 101, like in relative numbers. So, like, the difference between the best performance of all DPS and the worst performance of all DPS is less than 50%. And the difference between the average performance, I think... Yeah, Machinist is just below Red Mage here. The difference between the lowest average performance and highest average performance... Oh, there was a thing there. And yes, that is correct, guys. So the BGM over there is the uh, is Cradle of Hope. Um, the difference there from 93.84 down to 86.51 is less than 10%. It's less than 8%. It's such a minuscule difference that a really good machinist can beat an okay black mage. Which is why, as Dan said, a clear is a clear. You can beat all of the content in the game with basically any job. You just need to do it well and do it right. Him. And that's that's really what it boils down to. But sometimes people can forget that. They can get too focused on meh, maximum damage. Which is um, not always the best idea. I recall, like specifically, if a job is, from the community's perception, viewed as bad, then it is likely that it can't fight groups even if it is good enough. Also, people are saying Xenoglossy too strong. I've mentioned this before, but did you know that Xenoglossy started the expansion at a potency of 660? Six hundred and sixty. And right now, Xenoglossy is at 880. There's a reason why the journey of Black Mage has been that early in earlier in the expansion, I recall that Fast Mage, <coughs> the, 
the fast mage was really good and then the longer like the more buffs things like xenoglass he got the better slow mage crit mage became because the key thing is that speed speed will not make your cooldowns better most of the time like if you have an attack that does 880 potency and you get one of them every 30 seconds having more spell speed doesn't give you more of those aren't most top passes bought it at this point i don't think they're bought it but they are usually they're usually so perfectly optimized that it might as well be uh, Eric says we should also raise remember that grey passes are still clears and that is also true. Often the first clears of a raid tier, they will be, you know, pink passes because like they were the first. But by the time the raid tier has gone on for a little bit, those passes are almost certainly grey by comparison. Chandler says why are some so drastic from worst of a class to best? Like, Reaper, I think, seemed like a pretty small margin. Is that just due to difficulty for class, like, needing to move a lot or something? You saw Black Mage had, like, an actually, like, hilariously long, long bar from minimum to maximum. Black Mage is considered one of the hardest jobs in the game. And a bad Black Mage is almost worse than bringing an extra healer to DPS for you, in most cases. Because Black Mage can come, like... Most DPS jobs can at least do something decent in terms of damage while they run. But Black Mage loses nearly all of its damage if it just starts running around. And to just do something decent, like if the Black Mage insists on running an excessive amount, they will, in most cases, need to know how to do decent damage while running. Things like Infinite Paradox, which is still not great, but it's complicated, so it's not easy to be mobile as a black mage. So that's kind of the idea that the like the smaller the margin is, the more likely it is that the job is considered easier to play decently well. And that's also the reason why you saw that Summoner had like its average tick was really high compared to like the actual maximum. That it was like way off to the side. Where other jobs were like it was more centered. <clears throat> um, and that is also an interesting point Ajibasta mentions that sometimes it's more popular it has more passes and things like that and if a job is really popular then people then bad players are more likely to play it which also leads to like a worse average and things like that it's very complicated with this that is also an important part to keep in mind when we look at logs is that the logs are actual performances by actual players which means that it isn't always perfectly indicative of what is actually true um are we winning Kind of. I, th I think. I think we made it. We made. We made it to the destination. We did it in uh, two hours and eight minutes. And according to Vince, I think we could have saved like was it twelve minutes, something like that, around twelve minutes at the very least. What about twelve. So this would have been a longer path than the uh, the one from Gangos to to um, Hopper's Hold. Hopers hold. Um, right, but we reached the destination, so the next thing we're doing is probably look at some clips. But before that, let me just... Uh, uh, let's just do this. And then I'll be right back, and then we look at clips. In the meantime... Sanity restored.
All right, I'm back. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh. Clips. IG Plus, does this watch my cat clip? I have it here. Don't don't you worry. I have it right here. What job do you all think this cat is playing? Warrior. <laughs> It, it is a chonky cat. It, ha it probably has a lot of HP. Because it's not hitting any buttons. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like a Dragoon player. It, it probably... He, he would probably instantly... Is that truly a chai? <laughs> <laughs> You'd probably instantly turn into a dragoon if you like snuck a pickle in behind it. What job is the most likely to want to go through a window? Probably something that could backflip through it. And that that is actually a really good point, Jess. And this is actually that, 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 that is actually a pretty good thing to like finish up this conversation about optimization with is that something you might notice is that selfish jobs have a tendency to do better in party finder in some capacity what does that mean it means that white mages and sages have a tendency to perform a little bit better than scholars and astrologians in party finder groups because party finder groups are often less coordinated less coordinated Basically, the better coordinated your raid team is, the more valuable raid buffs become as a result. Um, which means that jobs that don't have that or don't care about that perform better on average. As Jess says, a reliable machinist is going to perform better than a dancer and a bard, or a dancer or a bard, because the dancer and the bard relies on their damage buffs actually aligning with everyone else's burst which they might not <clears throat> so dragoon a red mage bard in a pinch um yeah nice nice cat i uh that is a uh, that is an 11 out of 10 cat rg buster I hope it. I hope it enjoyed the condensation. And exactly, Cole. It also depends on the people they're buffing being competent. And in a coordinated group, where like in a static, you can actually rely on the group you're playing with becoming better with time. But with randoms, you don't know that that samurai is actually garbage until you've seen them play, and then you go, "Oh boy, I should not have gone dance over this one." <clears throat> Wool says, a friend of mine was in Uwu clear for one party. Someone in the group greeted so hard for his past that he wiped the party multiple times. And indeed, this is the reason why passing isn't everything. <laughs> John Gibbets, about setting up the biggest buff. So I'm, like, I'm going to enkindle second GCD. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but you can't imagine in casual content how many times I've gone in a summoner, summoned Bahamut, and held my Enkindle, held it, and waited, and waited, and then been like, I, I, I don't think any raid buffs are coming, and then just let it rip. And then like two seconds later, technical finish happens, you're sitting there like... Past brain encourages some truly maidenless behavior. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Let me put it like this. Some people complain that healers are are evaluated on their ability to do damage in Final Fantasy XIV. 
I will say that in some capacity, it is maybe good because the alternative is that healers were evaluated on their passes based on how much healing they did. Could you imagine for a moment, you're like five minutes into like a boss fight and the white mages, ooh, are completely out of MP. No cooldowns left. Meanwhile, the scholars, they're like <sighs> attacking like normal. Somehow, you make it through and kill the boss. Because the healers are val evaluated on healing in this, like in this particular context, for example, the white mage that just cast Medica 2, like they actually like pre-cast Medica 2 to hit exactly when damage came, or they use Cure 3 exactly when damage comes, they got the higher pass because they healed more. Even though the scholar did the better performance by actually using the cooldown smartly. Herodel says, I am that white mate. <laughs> well, the key difference is doing that preemptive cast to do the healing if it is needed, as opposed to doing it because you want to have the highest healing done. <clears throat> Thank you for celebrating that over a year, by the way, as a as a as a cultist, Coco. Thank you so much. Also, nice nice bunny with sunglasses. <laughs> now that that's a good picture. Not to mention, you could just spam your three for a massive heal pass. The key thing is, if it evaluates based on healing done, then you need there to be healing needed, and you have to wait until people take damage. It depends on whether overhealing counts or not. I remember this being a thing in World of Warcraft. Because when I was raiding in Legion... There was a boss in Nighthold. It was hard to do, but you could do it with one healer. And there you raided 20 players, by the way. So one healer and 19, like two tanks and then 17 DPS. Um, the reason why I know it was possible was because when we had gotten that boss like down pat enough, every time we reached that boss, the raid leader, which again was a healer, I don't know why I have this consistency to be in like raid teams where the healer was the, kill, was the raid leader, uh, asked which healer wanted to pass this week because the way to get a really high pass was to solo heal it there's no way to get a high pass if there was more than one healer in the group because everyone could solo heal it right now the the passes could solo heal it which means that the rest of us kind of just had to deal with the problem that if the healer had a hard time with it we were making it harder for ourselves so that the healer could pass <laughs> Um, right, by the way, it, when I check clips, by the way, it, I, I've said this, I usually say this, um, I prioritize clips where the person who has posted the clip is actually in the chat. So I'm just saying, uh, I believe Chingus is Oscar Long, is that right? And then I also have clips from uh, Murfolk, which I saw earlier, Vjek, Zaf. Gasol, Luminia, Emia, and Gasol. So, if you are in the chat, especially if your chat, if your YouTube chat name doesn't match with your uh, Discord name, it may be helpful if you make it make it known, so that I can uh, see who's here and who's not. What's the point of passing? Do you get anything other than bragging rights? Nope, that's it. That is actually it. 
the reason why people pass is often because they want to know how well they how well they're doing compared to others um like it's complicated but essentially and this is something I talked about before is that if you get a DPS meter to see if you're doing better the easiest way to know whether you're doing better is to see whether you did more damage than last time at some point like at some point you stop caring about whether you did better than yourself some people at least do and start caring more about did you do better compared to others and well if you can see exactly how many people you're doing better than that is the easiest way to do that and you might be wondering how do you do that a pass number is actually the percentage of players you are better than with that pass at least at the time of that pass which means that if you get a one percent pa pass like a gray pass it means you were about as good or better than 1% of players that beat this boss with the job you're playing. With all context removed. Which means that, well, some of those players were summoners. Like if we're comparing summoners. That summoner happened to use a raise. So they fell behind. Um, and this is why passing can be problematic. Because passing completely ignores all the utility. And this is part of the reason why defensive cooldowns and tenacity and all these things lose value. Because... Well, passing only focuses on how much damage you did. Exactly, guys. Well, zero pass is still a clear. Part of the problem with saying that, however, is that... The zero passing summoner might have been in group with a 90 passing samurai. Which means that the zero passing summoner... Yes, they beat it, but they got carried. Um, as Cole also said, there's a very high chance, there's a very high chance that the zero pass got carried. And the reason why I say chance is because the first clear of a boss is probably really low compared to the final ones. It's just that the, the first clear will be a 100 pass because it's the only one. But if you could look back on how they compare to the passes two months down the road, they might be like 40 or 30 passes because people got better at the fight. People got better gear and all that. Also, welcome back, Emir. Yeah, we have we have we have looked at a cat video. I will have you know. Uh, Chandler says, "Is there a way to see that information on console?" Nope. The only way you can measure your performance is either by having someone else pass you or like uh, track your damage and stuff, or like the in-game option is Stone Sky C, but that's not optimal. Um, but yeah, the, the reason for passing is often that it's about comparison. That's why I said that it's speedrunning rankings when we looked at uh, the speed at the ranking file, like the specific ranks I was showing you earlier to show like the specific group composition. It's specifically because that's when it becomes a speedrun. And speedruns are basically only about ranking, right? It's about how much faster you could do that thing than others could. Do tanks pass? Yeah, of course they do. Healers do as well. Right. Uh, well, I know Zaf and Ymir is here and Gazl is here. <coughs> um. <laughs> well, that, that's certainly something, Coco. <laughs> I did, Ymir. That's why I said we have seen a cat video. Um, can I suggest people do a touch grass pass? Some people could certainly use that. That's for sure. Bit off topic. Should healers do better DPS than tanks? 
Uh, I've talked about this in a few videos. Um, based on observations, it appears to be the case that tanks can usually do around two thirds of the DPS of an average DPS job. The important part about me saying this is that the average damage of a DPS is a pretty wide spectrum, right? Do you mean a dancer? Do you mean a black mage? Eh, somewhere in between. Like an average DPS, a tank can do about two thirds of that. There are of course also bursts and filler and all that, but over the course of a fight, around two thirds is um, possible. Healers peak at like closer to half of that. And when I say peak, I mean white mages and sages might be able to do that with personal damage. But astrologians, they will never do that amount of damage. They will like contribute close to the same amount of damage as a sage or a white mage would possibly more if your group is coordinated. But they will not do like much more than half at best. Which means that if the tank and the healer are both playing well, then the tank will do considerably more damage than the healer. They should. And if the healer has to cast any healing spells for any reason, then they fall further behind. <laughs> He's touching flowers right now, does that count? <laughs> Mm. Right then. Um Well, we talked about Abyssal Fracture earlier actually. So we have Zaf that did a zero Zemromus minimum item level no echo run, which is rather interesting because Zeromus Abyssal Fracture Extreme was a kind of almost quote-unquote dead on arrival kind of content in quotes because that's not exactly what it was the second extreme trial in any given raid tier is usually released at a point where everyone already has like all savage raiders already have better gear like better weapons than the extreme itself drops which means that if it's a savage raider who's doing the fight they probably don't need anything from this boss which means that they will beat over it very, very easily. And specifically, Abyssal Fracture was generally considered a little too easy by a lot of players. Like, maybe it's a little bit more forgiving or something, but it doesn't help if it then also is the second extreme in a raid tier because of this problem. Um, but we could watch this. A minimum item level no echo would, of course, mean that these kinds of advantages that would normally make this kind of content quote-unquote dead on arrival is now gone. Is there anything in particular you think we should pay attention to here, Zaf? Kragen Moses, it's got to admit, most of the time when people start talking about passes, I want to toss them to the rank PvP boards. Oh man, I remember when they shared the uh, the win rates in Crystalline Conflict ranked of the different jobs in the first Crystalline Conflict season. Oh, that was funny. That was so funny. The thing that was really funny about that Is that, and let me just pause here to take that uh, side side track. What was really funny about that is specifically that the jobs that people said were amazingly good, like the best jobs in PvP, White Mage, for example, I believe Warrior was up there as well, um, because in Season 1 people didn't know how to handle these kind of jobs in PvP. Um, they had bad win rates, like they had below 50%. Meanwhile, 
jobs like Black Mage, which was originally considered so bad that, like... The development team got so much feedback saying that Black Mage was terrible that they overbuffed it. The particular story is like almost legendary. You may not have heard about this. Um. Uh, Black Mage got super buffed. Then, like a week before the patch actually arrived, Yoshi P put out like a message basically saying, We're going to real like take back seas some of those buffs because I actually went into Crystalline Conflict myself and played Black Mage, and Black Mage is fine. Perfectly fine. You're all just bad. He didn't say that, but he basically said the most politically correct way of saying, No, Black Mage isn't bad. You are. <laughs> Um, Cole says Dark Knight is the best job in PvP. Do you mean Frontline? Because Dark Knight is very busted in Frontline, at least. But Frontline and Crystalline Conflict are two completely different universes. Gleaming says maybe it's because I'm just getting into extremes, but like Zeromos is way harder than Golbus. I cleared Glo Golbus in three lockouts and we still haven't finished Zeromos. It's difficult to say because difficulty is also like subjective. I found, um, personally, I found, like back in the second rate tier, I found Storm's Crown way more overwhelming than P5S. Something that is important to keep in mind, Chandler, is that in PvP, all jobs are different. Like, they get a completely different toolkit. Healers can't even, like, healers cannot heal nearly as much in PvP, because they mostly have cooldowns for that. As I've said, the healing is, uh, is pretty tight on this fight. Interesting. An interesting thing that I remember when I looked at this fight compared to the normal version. By the way, I believe that uh, there is a macro or something making the uh, the tell sound, uh, the default tell sound every so often in the footage. Um, but the thing that I noticed is that I felt like Zeromos had more of the... Um, in extremes, especially, I feel like it's more common that bosses basically just have the normal version mechanics, but way harder, or hits harder. Uh, and I felt like Seromus had more of this than Golbis. Um, that doesn't make it easier or harder. It's just an observation. Might have to finish leveling Dark Knight then. Well, you can do PvP on Dark Knight at level 30. Because all stats are normalized in PvP. Oh yeah, this mechanic is the classic. You get a sandwich of like three different debuffs. The macro tries to remind me to reapply the Reaper buff. That's a little concerning to have in an extreme encounter, I will say. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, the party finder killer. That doesn't look any good. If the, if the line is red, then bad things happen if you don't do anything about it. Because it'll smack into a different comet and then you die. I believe it, it basically wipes you, if I remember correctly. Yeah, same, Brontome. Actually, I have turned off the sound for tells in, uh, in my game, specifically so that if I'm streaming, I don't give you all a jump scare because someone sent me a tell or something. Which, of course, also means that if you see me in-game and I'm, like, 
and you send a tell to me or emote at me and I'm just not responding. Oh, that's a lot of damage. Then it's often because I'm not looking at the screen and I can't hear you. <laughs> if you look at the meteor funny, the party wipes and Zero Zeromo's tea bags you. <laughs> Specifically, does he do that? Uh, does it, does she, is it, is it a she or an it? Or a he even, like what is it? It's a Zeromus. <laughs> Zeromus does a Fortnite dance. <laughs> Zeromus grows legs and does the lop hop on you. Something that I want to say here is that this might be because like it this group has like practiced a bunch. I don't know how many how much Sav has practiced this one. But this doesn't look that different from um like any other group doing the fight. I'm guessing that the fight is significantly longer given that it's, you know, eleven minutes. I wonder why there isn't any black mages in this fight. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Thank you, Girahin. Yeah, the interesting part is that I think the two things that like really stand out to me as different from the normal and the savage, normal and the extreme version of Abyssal Fracture is yes there are the, the, some of the mechanics hurt most of the mechanics hurt way more so like they're more strict but the two things that i specifically noticed that are different like drastically different is that the debuff debuff sandwich is uh, a little uh, significantly scarier in a way the meteor thing where you have to align those and then there is the uh, the black hole where you get sucked in where you have more control over exactly where it goes. Um, those are like the three mechanics where I'm like, that feels drastically different than a normal. But aside from that, I feel like most of the mechanics look like they're kind of the same as a normal. Just maybe happen a little faster. Maybe they have like bigger area to the AOE. Maybe the telegraph is... Uh, shown for less time maybe it's not even shown at all that doesn't mean that the fight is easier but it's an interesting com did you did you not use communio there <laughs> was that intentional that's just uh, chunky bits i feel like there was a bunch of things that went wrong there No communio. <clears throat> I don't know, Cole, that was exactly what I was saying, is that... Um, that often extremes are exactly like that. That they're not too different from the normal version. It's just that it's, like, slightly more complex. Also, enjoy Chandler, and I do have actually multiple tanks. I have a video about tanking anxiety, which might be helpful for you if you're afraid of it. I have Dark Knight guides, I have tips for tanks, I have a, a video talking about the kind of mistakes tanks often make. All this kind of stuff. I have tons of tanking content, actually. And that makes sense, Saf. Like, the question was whether it was better to run away and survive. And it is. And then the second follow-up question is then, do I sit on my GCD until I can use, safely can use Communio, or do I just let it rip and just leave it? I mean, that, that is also the observation that, uh, that I've seen given him, that the, uh, the Meteor is the killer mechanic. It's like, a lot of the time, 
there are, is like one or two specific like key mechanics on a hard fight that really is the deciding factor whether you can or can't do it. <clears throat> Jake says, I hate, have to say it hurts me to see people click their buttons, but hey, not everyone has an MMO mouse. And not everyone eh, ever like wanted to or bothered to, uh, to learn to like uh, deal with everything being keybound. Levin Strike Summoning say says hi. Wait, where's Levin Strike Summoning? <gasps> P9S. Right. I've done Ramu Extreme recently, and he has an attack called Shock Strike, which sounds simi similar. So. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Levin Strike and Devour on P5S, for example. This is where it all fall apart, falls apart. Well, maybe you can survive. <clears throat> Does this part of the fight, I believe, it loops a lot? This is the kind of a phase in a fight where it is really hard to get back up if you go down. Because every time you get up, the boss is like, right, do you remember? Did you see the thing I was just preparing eight seconds ago? Oh, well, you're dead now. Uh, QLMCA says, I've been playing this game for, for the past week. And it feels quite lonely. Is there a social aspect? And at what point does it get more social? There's a lot of social aspects. It's really hard to say exactly because... Like, if you're on a free trial, there's very limited options for you. If you have bought the game, you could jo join a free company. I think a free trial can also join the Novice Network. Just ask about it in a, in a major city, and a mentor would be able to invite you. And then you have people to talk with. But a lot of the MSQ itself is kind of lonely as a result of, the being, of it being a lot of solo duties as well. Game M says, if I was healing this, I'd probably have ripped the LB3. <laughs> you know, if you had a healer LB3 and a healer live right about now, it would be kind of nice. Oh, you wiped. I didn't even realize that. Oh, that's, that's a good video. That's also a good video. That was so close, by the way. That was why I was, I, I was expecting you to beat it. Well, that's sad. We'll get him next time. I, I don't understand, Archie Buster. I actually watch so little content on this account that most of the video recommendations are based on the fact that I often open my own videos and the videos you sent me. And because it's Final Fantasy 14, it's like, well, this person also does Final Fantasy 14. Who's this guy? It's the person why is his accent so good. Thank you. Yeah, I wonder what the enrage is. The, the thing is with uh, Zeromos, and I don't know how many of you noticed that, it's both clear. It's all, both the case on normal and on savage, savage on extreme. But the boss actually switches phase based on HP, which means that if you're going really, really slow, then you can end up in a in a phase for longer. And that means that a certain HP threshold, to my knowledge, that fight you you know you notice how the we basically have like Eurobeat Pokemon battle music for like the first majority of the fight and then suddenly the boss turns extra red and then the music changes. That final bit is a little comparable to End Thing and like the desperation stuff where it just kinda loops the same thing over and over again. But because it loops the same thing over and over again. <coughs> uh it makes it uh, um, 
it may I guess it makes it hard for me to say when, when enrage would be. Maybe it's based on that. Maybe it's fixed. It could be that it's 11 minutes and 20 seconds. And that's the saddest part, Mick, because it seemed like the group held it together right up until that point. Let me ask, can you do mine? Sure. Yours was a gunbreaker on controller. Also, let me let me actually maybe a bit much to have double music, don't you think? Double music. Against Ravana Hard. Hmm. Interesting choice to combine uh, uh, your 1 2 3 combo with Sonic Break. Hmm. Personally, <laughs> I'm Waltz, anyone? <laughs> Uh, Sonic, I would probably have put the uh, Blasting Zone or Danger Zone there, simply because of how... Well, maybe not, because you'd probably use Danger Zone alongside your uh, Gnashing Fang combo anyway, so maybe not. I can roast you if you play melee. <laughs> Well, I feel like... So I've had Ymir and Gazel sent clips so often that I feel like I'm running out of things to point out. I sing Ravana's song at work all the time. Do, do you just open your mouth and sing this? Or do you mean like the phase two thing? Although that would be pretty impressive. You just open your mouth and just this comes out. <laughs> Maybe you're just sitting there at work going, bah, 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 bah. <laughs> Furious as a place! Hey, welcome back, Gazu. We are reviewing clips. We reached our destination in Ultima Thule. Right now, we are watching Ymir's uh, first tanking performance on controller. That prelude to Slaughter and Slaughter Cast is way too long. It's weirdly long, yeah. That is actually also something I noticed when I've like gone into like if I've had like Ravana on my Wondrous Tales, I've been confused as to why it takes this long on extreme to get on with it. Like that's really weird. Like I get it on normal or on hard, I guess, but on extreme? That's when it gets really strange. The other tank was spamming Provo. Well, it's not that bad to let the other tank tank if they really, 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 really want to. It's mostly a problem. Oh. We wind it back real quick. Just a quick one for anyone who doesn't understand this mechanic, because this particular mechanic is classic. Like a classic one people don't get. He does this. I believe that's the seeing tail. I know you understand it, Emir. What this mechanic means, for those that don't understand it, it means if you hit him from the front or the back while this buff lasts, you will get retaliated every time you attack. So you don't want to be here or here. 
You want to be here or here. And you might then be thinking, but wait, what if I'm a tank? What, what, what if I'm tanking the boss? What do I do then? You don't do anything. <laughs> you don't do anything. You just stand there for like five or six seconds. Like optimally, of course, you may, might be able to just have healers that heal through it. On ha on extreme, he blocks three out of four sides. Yes, uh, three out of four sides, I believe. <laughs> you jerk! <laughs> you just give it to the other tank. You figure it. I don't want him anymore. <laughs> Yeah, I believe he has the seeing tail and the seeing wing. And wing is, of course, sides, which is easy to deal with. And then there's seeing tail, where the tank just goes... Oh, man. Well, that's an interesting point, Jess. He, he has... He, he, Rithatun has this as well. Rock, uh, Rocky says, I think this is the boss that told me to actually look at the boss as well instead of just the floor. Sadly, it took me until the end of Endwalker to realize I also have to look at the background. <laughs> that can happen. When I did uh, Aglaia the first few times. The first few t Oh, I think, I think, Imi, are you dead? The first few times. I didn't realize that the color of the background changed based on which mode he was in. Like whether it was blue or golden. I looked so hard at the boss that I didn't even realize that the color of the arena behind him changed color. <laughs> like I didn't realize until someone mentioned it to me. I think it was Sip that was like, by the way. Cole says you're missing a burst strike in your no mercy. I did I didn't notice that. I was a little bit more concerned with looking at the boss mechanics itself, but that might be true. Uh That does make sense. And it would be one of the things that might go wrong when you suddenly have, like, your UI looks different. Um, your buttons are in different places. Oops, you broke your combo there. Used solid barrel instead of brutal shell. That is a, a sad no mercy. Also, I... The boss normally doesn't get to do this. I mean, you didn't die, which is a good start. Yeah, usually that mechanic there at the end, he doesn't get to do the, uh, what was it? Swift Slaughter, he usually dies during that cast in most groups. And I just want to point out that, <clears throat> obviously that's not only thanks to Ymir maybe making a mistake or two. Uh, it is worth pointing out that um, there's been some deaths. Ymir survived unlike the other tank. There's also a tank limit break, it looks like. Um, but I think I think that went with pretty well. I've seen worse, Ymir. Stagging Samurai and Gunbreaker in party comp? I mean, this is hard. And it's probably trial roulette. Craig, 
Swift Slaughter casts at the same speed. No, he's, he's charging up to Slaughter swiftly. Yeah, Gleaming, I have a controller. I'm just really bad at controller. Like, I'm really bad at it. So I would rather not. So I've just never tried. Never tried. <clears throat> and I think, I think that was pretty good, Ymir. Next challenge day. Would you really want to want me to spend all that time setting up keybinds for one job on controller just so that that could be a challenge? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Understandable. M. I believe Gazel is here as well, right? Would you prefer the Pandemonium or the near one, Gazel? <clears throat> wow, we have a lot from uh, Viech. Hachibazda <laughs> says, Kai replaced Aradel with a bot that regularly links to the Discord confirmed. No, Aradel does that uh, of their own free... Uh, Free will. I've actually not uh, said that that must be done, but it's very much appreciated because I don't have time to spam that every few, every, every, every so often. Aerodale is just that good. P12 one. Okay, we do that one. Oh, right. No sound on your clips. <clears throat> That's also the main reason why I have a controller gaming is because sometimes games are just unplayable on a controller. But I will say if I get if I get a, if I pick up a game and then the game is like, "Oh, well, it's only really good on controller." And I go in and I see that the keyboard controls and mouse controls are terrible. I immediately go like, "Ah, then I don't actually know if I want to." Like, it immediately just makes my interest just go... Because I'd rather play on mouse and keyboard. Also, thank you for the super chat, Ymir. I'll, I'll see what I can do, but I don't think I can uh, be ready for it for next time I do a challenge. Uh, maybe the next uh, the time after that I'll have controller set up ready specifically for that. Jake says, I will play all Souls games on Control and Monster Hunter games, Claw Hand and all. Let me put it like this. Uh, I... I went into Monster Hunter when it came to PC, like Monster Hunter World on PC, and I played mouse and keyboard, and I know it is no problems, not a single problem whatsoever. And I've heard people basically like, like, long-term Monster Hunter players be like, Ugh! Ugh, I could like keyboard and mouse. Well, that's probably the reason why you're so bad at the game. And you're like, I'm not bad at the game, though. <laughs> I'm not bad at the game. And then they're like, brain breaks, right? Like, how's that possible? Because control is impossible. And like, have you noticed that there's a greater percentage of bow players on mouse and keyboard? It's almost like it's easier to aim with that. Um, and I also had the experience that I was so interested in Monster Hunter when it came out that I got a Switch to get Generations Ultimate, to get more Monster Hunter because I ran out of, like, things to do in World. And I didn't get nearly as far in Generations Ultimate because it was on a controller. Like, that was the reason. I just couldn't deal. Wolves, did you see the devs talking about why they don't want to implement cross-region DC travel? I... Did I have actually made a video that I, that talks about that subject myself, and it is partly grounded in some of the things they've said. Blade. 
But uh, right, uh, Gasol is playing Red Mage on a on 242 GCD because um, Credendum Gear is awesome, uh, and Gasol is also playing on some latency. What's your main weapon in Monster Hunter? My main weapon in Monster Hunter is Gun Lance. <laughs> I'm not a robot. There's no Omicron cell in the community. <laughs> um, yeah, I mainly use gun lens. Favorite gun lens play style? I really liked to do shelling. But in Rise, uh, using the blast... Uh, the blast jumping and stuff like that is way too fun. Uh, in world, I use wide shelling, so I could just go bam, 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 which is very good defensively. You don't need very many offensive skills to maximize this damage, which meant I had like think of a defensive skill, and there's a very high chance I would have it. That is also a way to do it. I, uh, if we're talking opener here, you could have used acceleration and swift cast into double the thunder here, but that—that that is of course me being a little bit. Uh... Now this is a mistake. <laughs> we can just start with that. We actually, we've actually gone over exactly this mistake before. When you open as red mage, the reason why the optimized openers go like the thunder the arrow acceleration swift cast thunder thunder is and not thunder arrow is because you want your mana types your white and black mana to be not equal when you start a melee combo you always want your mana types to be uneven when you start a melee combo the reason why you want to do this is because, and this is specifically, and we actually talked about this recently, that others were like, where does it say that you have to do that? The Flare and the Holy themselves state this. Exactly, Kylan, it was you. Um, they have a 20% chance of giving you the Fire or the Stone procs. Unless you're using them while you have less of their mana type. So if you have less black mana than white mana, then the flare has a 100% chance of giving you the fire. And the opposite for the holy. Um, having equal amounts of them means that you don't have less. That's it. Like the restrict, like the the benefit on the flare of the holy is a strictly less than symbol, like an actual less than, not less than equal, less than. So you, whenever you're going to do a melee combo, you want to take a glance at your mana and go, are they uneven? And it would actually be great if you can make sure that one of them is like slightly ahead. That may gives you more space for that, but that is not a requirement, and it might like restrict you in different ways. I'm just saying this. That's a mistake that we might... It's probably not the only time we'll see this. I'll also say that you should probably have used Acceleration about now. Because you're sitting on that. Magic Barrier? Nice. Also, by the way, as a... <laughs> you can see we have three Red Mages, so maybe Magic and Magic Barrier won't help that much. Um, You did get... You did have... You do have a proc, at least, so that's good. I didn't see if you got that from the, the Flare, but that's not super important. The key thing and the reason why... Uh-oh, you're going to get hit, I think. Nope, same same side. Now that we have Flesh and Contra 6 on cooldown, if you can, you want to be sure that they are used exactly on cooldown. So Contra 6 is coming now. You chose to do a cast instead, that's fair enough. Your latency probably forces you to do that. Contra 6 is on, good. And there's acceleration, good. You could use Swift Cast as well if you really want to. Flesh, good. What? Wool says, my friend that plays Red Mage refuses to learn the proper rotation. 
He gets procs for the fire and the stone and uses those both at once. Then builds procs and uses both again. That is like a very strange variant of the wrong proc. I mean, if he refuses to learn the job right, there's not much you can do. If he doesn't if he doesn't want to learn, then like I mean, what you can do is, like, depending on what kind of friend it is, you can, like, really meme on them every time and be like, Did you notice that I did more damage than you? <laughs> Again. Weird, I'm playing healer today and I'm beating you. How's that possible? Hmm, maybe it's because of your rotation. Could that be a possibility? Wolves says one of my warrior friends didn't put his 90 abil level 90 ability on his hotbar at all for months. Did he not realize that it existed? Because that's a possibility. This so far still looks good. We have a uh, console 6 and flesh. Do you see them? You do? Nice. So far this looks great. Melee combo would actually be fine right now. Unless you see something else coming that gives you reason to not want a melee combo. Hmm. We're starting to reach a point where you have to make a decision. You could have used flesh there. You do the melee combo. You could use flesh now. You still do. You should use flesh now. <laughs> flesh is got the sixth. Got the sixth. You did see it. And then we have an additional melee combo. Yes. Now we use the holy. Yes. Now we have the double prox. And in an awkward thing with red mage is that this particular aspect, flesh, good. This particular aspect is a little bit comparable to um, <coughs> samurai uh, in that. Optimally, if you can make sure that you always apply Higanbana with a Yukikaze Sen and you exclusively spend Make Your Shisui on Gekko and Kasha, you get the most value out of your Sen and your Make Your Shisui. But that's not always possible when you're like optimizing, it's not always possible. Um, Red Mage has a similar thing, because if you're doing a melee combo, but you already have both procs, then it really doesn't matter which one you're doing, because you just refresh a proc you already have. And that can sometimes lead you to a situation where you're like, I don't want to use my melee combo if I can't actually generate a proc. And this is actually, there was actually a really, uh, strictly specific optimization trick that you might have seen me do sometimes here which is not really optimization but just kind of a silly minimal potential like resource gain that you wouldn't have otherwise and that actually perfectly aligns with this <clears throat> right now right now Gasol has a the fire proc so you don't if if you can help it you don't want to use the flare right now because it doesn't give you anything right but you may want to do a melee combo right now as we see shortly your options here are option one do another dual cast do the fire the arrow like do an additional one so that you can move your proc over to the white mana side essentially like you cast the fire you go up to 73 and then you do the, the arrow you go up to 78 but because white mana is ahead already if you get a first stone proc whatever you do a melee combo use the flare anyway if you don't get a stone proc whatever you do a melee combo and do the flare anyway but in this particular situation, if you want to do a melee combo, then if you do the flare, 
it doesn't matter that it has a 100% chance of giving you a fire proc because you already have it. You don't care. Which means that if you already started, if, if you are in this position and you want to do a melee combo, you have to do a melee combo for, I don't, like, it doesn't matter what the reason is. Sometimes the mechanic is just that, it's just like that. And that's what you do. Then it is actually better to use the holy in this particular state because there's a 0% chance of you gaining something if you use the flare this time around and there's a 20% chance of you getting something if you use the holy in this situation. I hope that makes sense, Gazel. And everyone else who might need it. So you do a melee combo here. And you can see if you use the flare here your 24 second the fire proc just goes back to 30. If you use the holy there's a 20% chance that you also get a stone proc. That is the reason. But you of course use the flare because you have less black mana. And that is the reason why I said it's like a very small like optimization thing because you're ultimately maybe getting a proc. Like 20% of the time my suggestion here would actually be a gain. And 80% of the time it would make no difference. Oh, that was really nice. That was a very good swift cast. I was specifically sitting, like, I was thinking here, can you actually dodge without, like, messing up with your DCD? What can you do? I was looking at acceleration, which was on cooldown, and you did swift cast arrow. That was very nice. That was very good. That was your out. Your alternative was do a melee combo, of course. <laughs> could you do that, actually? You couldn't. Now you could. And that's an interesting thing with Red Mage, is that their best attack is also a movement option. There was another thing here, and this is again a really, really minor thing. This is like an in retrospect thing. You want to use Adel here, apparently. I'm not saying you need to use Adel, it's more, you did. So, how do you do that? Uh, you can't triple weave at all. It's possible you can double weave. It seems like you've gotten away with double weaves. You double weave and then you go, oh, right. Also, Adel. I also need Adel. Triple weave, clip, and then you go on. It's a small, it's a small loss. It's a small one. It's just I noticed it. If you, if you, if you are in a position where you need to use a defensive if you want or need to use a defensive cooldown you want or need to use a defensive cooldown then that's also a weave so you need to make space for that or you lose dps as a result that engagement or engagement could have been delayed to the next gcd and it would have been fine because of the charge system <clears throat> exactly, Jake. Everyone has done the panic addle, and that's also why I'm like, it, it, it's not a big deal. It's just like an observation that if you knew before you started that set, like you go, you know, fast cast, slow cast, double weave. While you're casting the fast cast, you might be already be thinking, I'm going to use core a core and engagement, or engagement, and that's what I'm going to do. And then while you're doing that, you're like, oh, I should also use addle here. Things happen, but if you could have planned it, you could have delayed one of the weaves. The worst part is that my adult got overridden anyway. <laughs> That's even sadder. Also, hey Jace, hope you're doing well. Here's a day. This is a dangerous time to have your two minute burst ready. The good news is that someone else used Embolden. You could use modification here if you wanted to and just do AoE style. Um, but some people decide to just sit on everything for this phase. Oh, I think us healer dying now. What, what is he doing? What, what, what's happening? What's happening over here? <laughs> Are they hiding behind the chat? They're hiding behind the chat. Well, why? <laughs> why are you standing out in the blue flames of death? That's not safe. My man's not looking at his feet. <laughs> and... 
they survived somehow. Thought it was blueberry flavored. <laughs> I, I don't remember when I've last seen this. Everyone on the same side for this. That's incredible. Are you going to magic barrier? Yes. That, that's an interestingly angled patch of arms, but it does count. Yeah, I didn't know that either, Bad, bad Angel. I was sure. <laughs> Tremble! Um, and here's the melee combo, of course. And it seems like your uh, embolden got to stay. And no one else overlapped theirs with yours. Did both of the other red mages use theirs before the intermission? No, it's, it's just it's just P twelve N Phil, but uh... <coughs> couldn't tell. We can check that. We can check that afterwards. Nope, it does not, Yuri. In the it basically reduces. What? Did you just get latency sniped? Yuri, uh, the way Passage of Arms works, of course, is that the Paladin blocks all attacks while holding Passage of Arms. Everyone behind the Paladin gets a 15% damage reduction effect. Just a regular damage reduction effect. It isn't, like, uh, directional in any way. It just looks funny when the Paladin steps up over next to the raid and then, like, Passage of Arms sideways. It just looks funny. You moved in time. You moved in time. You just had lag. You moved in time. You didn't fail there. You moved in time. That just sucks sometimes. My brain was filled with... Oh, right. I have enough mana to burst. <laughs> Aww. Yeah, this is just normal, Phil. I can tell it didn't move in time. I'm just saying that if I was playing like on EU, then I would have like, like looking at the boss's animation. Then now, like you could move now. It should be early enough now when you moved as well. But because you have, like, latency, you have, like, a ghost, like, half a second behind you or something. And yeah, if you had moved into the attack animation, you would have not get sni got sniped. But it's more the principle that it shouldn't be necessary. Now, in regards of... Oh, nope, they didn't overlap, I think. Because one of them used it here... And, oh, they did kind of overlap. You can actually see it here. Uh, almost. If you look behind the chat, if you look behind the chat, you can actually see that uh, one of the red mages has, both of the red mages have both buffs, which means that there's an overlap. But yeah, because of uh, the way that the uh, snapshotting works, uh... Now, this area is safe. Now that area is safe. Now that area is safe. So you could just move sooner, but that's like, that's the thing is that if you were, if you had a better latency, you had moved in time. If you had better latency. That's why I said, I don't think you made a mistake there, Gazel. It's just that you had to move sooner because of your specific circumstances. But I think, I think you did pretty well. Hope we did uh, cover some things you could do better. Um, but uh, I think you did fine. Um, right. He misses I'm out of pink dye. Well... If you travel to the ends of the universe, I'll hand you some. You just have to 
come to me, I'll trade you some. Um. Well, that's a good a good uh, perspective, kind of. And yeah, if you can unbalance your gauge before you go for it, that would already help. He says, "I just got home again." Sorry, I was. I was like that. If you had said, "I am in game next to you," then I could have could have traded you. But I was in the middle of reviewing something. I couldn't see you. I can see that you were here. The double melee burst is a thing to learn as well. Well, it depends. Like, the, the difficult part about the double melee burst is that th it's only really significant if you... Like, the biggest portion of that is if you can get the ending part of the first burst inside raid buffs and then, like, the full second melee combo. Uh, like, that's the big deal. It's not like Red Mage gains huge value by doing two melee combos in quick succession. Um, and the reason why this the the importance of it has to be the second half of the first like uh, uh, the second half of the first melee combo and then another one is because the melee combo takes 12.7 seconds right just about but embolden lasts 20 seconds so if you use Embolden before you start the first melee combo, then you get the full combo, and then right as you use the Holy or the Flare in the second combo, Embolden ends. But if you could have pushed it so that you had the, the more magic attacks inside it, that would have been not great as well. You could do the Quart melee combo. You could do that as well. Now that's a weird one. Enjoy work, Bronto. Right. Um, I don't think I've seen a Sheik's. We could, um... You could use the modification after the third hit of the combo. Correct. You could do that. That is indeed something you can do. But it is worth pointing out that that doesn't change any... Like, that that just puts... Like, it just puts the modification damage buff in reverse. Um, but yeah, you could do that with Embolden. As in, you do 1, 2, 3, modification Embolden. Uh, you know, 4, 5, 6. And then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 again. You could do that exactly. Um, that is true. If you can double melee combo, does it mean you could hold Embolden start melee combo earlier so that Embolden affects combo ending both times? Uh, yes. But the way you should do it, optimally, is you use Embolden on cooldown. Right? Because raid buff timing. Use Embolden on cooldown. Which means that when you see that Embolden has like around four-ish seconds left on it, you go one, two, three, embolden magnification, or magnification embolden, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, you don't go, oh, embolden is ready, one, two, three, embolden magnification, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, so, like, that's the idea. The key is that Embolden, just like with Reaper and Arcane Circle, that one should go out on cooldown, so you just click that one when it comes up. But you then adjust your rotation to match, so you go, it's coming up, so I'll do my prep. 
Um, it is worth pointing out that doing this amount of prep might not be optimal. It is one of the weirdest things because as as embold no not not emboldened as your melee combo is your most mobile section of your rotation as a red mage. If you go like there's a super mobile set like a, a section of the fight where you need to move a lot. Um. Because of that, um, if you sit on your melee combo and go, oh no, 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 I need to keep that for my double melee combo burst, um, then you're losing damage if you can't keep up the pressure while moving. Because that's what the melee combo often offers. And yeah, Brontome, kind of, that is actually something they have a bit in common. Because Reaper is exact like that's exactly the way Reaper's Reaper's Dublin Shroud does. Because Arcane Circle lasts twenty seconds, you go into Enshroud, you do one Reap and Death's Design, and one Reap and Death's Design to like pass time <coughs> specifically so that you can Enshroud immediately again once the first one is over. Because Enshroud has a 15 second cooldown. You basically waste 5 seconds by using Death's Design twice. <clears throat> and then you do Arcane Circle and finish the burst. Plentiful Harvest into another burst. And then you can just about fit the second Communio inside Arcane Circle as well. So it's kind of the same idea. Um, and the reason, everyone, why Brontome has this reaction is because Brontome has made the joke that Reaper and Red Mage are basically the same. With the way they build up to a, a melee combo and a burst. And from that observation, Red Mage is getting one more step to their melee combo and Dawn Trail claim. No proof. And Reaper is getting one more step to their Enshroud finisher, as in a step after Communio. Because they're basically red mage, is the idea. Um, so that's the reason for the reaction. <coughs> now, uh, Vjek, are you still here? Do you, do you have a preference for one of these uh, three? Watch me be right. I mean, that's the thing. If you make a claim, the worst that can happen is that you're wrong. And some people don't really mind that. And if you're right, then you're a mega genius, right? <clears throat> because you guessed right. Right, so Vjek went in and did O12S duo because you can't actually solo phase one soinks swing imagine here's a, actually there is a solution if they don't want to give red mage an additional let me just... Uh, if they don't want to give Red Mage an additional melee combo step, but they still want to fix the weird a asymmetry where uh, the full melee combo takes the same time as 5 GCDs and not an even number, they could make it so that um, Resolution gives you dual cast. Which would be so weird, because it means that if you go in with no procs, then you like do the flare, get your fire proc, and then you go resolution, and then you finish with the arrow. And then you also get a bestowed proc from one melee combo. There's also your suggestion in here. What was your suggestion again? Oh, right, that Scorch and Resolution are changed into one of them being an AoE option and the other one being a single target option as two different finishers. 
That is also a way to do it. There's also the option of they give you an additional melee combo step. There's also the possibility that the developers actually go, no, actually, we like it this way. Because then there's some, like, optimization here with the extra GCD awkwardness. Like, that's actually the way we wanted it. Um, and they do nothing and give you something else. If they don't give Red Mage one more boom, what could they give them though? Make repri repri Reprise one mana? They could do that. I don't know if that would be good or bad. Or do they just give Reaper specifically the next Red Mage combo step added to their burst? You just give Reaper? <laughs> um, right. So, for anyone curious, the reason why this fight is completely impossible to solo is simply because there is a part where there's two bosses and you need two players to deal with it at some point. Um, part of it being that I believe you can't actually kill the boss before they loop to this spe a specific mechanic the second time. This boss has a mechanic once the both of the bosses are on the field where um, they get a buff that makes, makes them basically one-shot you. Or, uh, and, and also, they take basically no damage. If they're next to each other, um, but it can also be that if they're far away from each other. Like, it's either or, either if they're far from each other or if they're close to each other. Um, but because of this... Uh, like, if you get the one where they have to be close to each other, where, where it's okay that they're close to each other, then you can just fight them normally, solo. But the second time they do the mechanic, it'll be the one where they they have to be far from each other, where, where you want them far from each other, and you can't do that. And alone, you can't do enough damage to skip that, as far as I know. Like, you just can't. You can't do it in one, in one loop, essentially. Which is kind of the reason, I believe. Did you know that Warrior cannot solo this fight? Correct. It doesn't matter which job uh, Viek had brought to this fight, it wouldn't be able to solo it. Now that, that looks concerning. Also, I will say, interesting observation, the tank friend that uh, Viek brought has like two-thirds of the HP. Like that, there's a massive gear difference here. The damage is too low and the invuln is not back in time. Indeed. <coughs> um, it, it, it is interesting that that happens because what what this means is there is a, this weird situation. Oh, we got the stack configuration. There's this weird situation where you can actually solo. You can solo phase two of this fight but not phase one. Phase one is impossible to solo at this moment. I imagine when we get to, uh... I imagine when you get to, uh... Phase... When we get to Dawn Trail, it is possible. By the way, actually, I can't remember... Was there a case where a Blue Mage could solo this? Or was it just that a Blue Mage could survive a particular hit? What was it, Viek? Because I do remember we talked about that. Um. Blue can solo it. Well, there you go. <clears throat> oh, sorry, Emir. Well, that was what you said. I wasn't sure because of the way you spelled phase. Sorry. Can Blue Mage not solo phase two? Because that, that is even funnier if that's true. Because then you have a regular job can't solo phase one, and a blue mage can't solo phase two, so you need the power of both. Just give my shadow taunt. Well, you also would need your shadow to survive for longer than 20 seconds, I think. <clears throat> give red mage fire four. Ooh.
just have to swap jobs in the middle of the fight. Oh, yeah. That's pretty smart. Uh, I'll think about that. That would be pretty genius if you could do that. It would be pretty funny if there was a... Like, imagine if there was, like, a solo duty at some point where you're allowed to switch job in the middle of the fight. Like, a little bit like how they do in the, um... In the uh, Shadowbringers trailer. <clears throat> and why it had... Why I say a solo duty is specifically because it would be like it would be chaotic if it was like a group thing and it would also be very very like cinematic if you could do that yeah, exactly the segmented solo run <laughs> eh. the other thought was that soul so whatever it's called for reaper gets dual cast mm. now that would be strange and also a little boring Bring two accounts. <laughs> now that's a good ad, Aridal. That's a good that's a good Discord server ad advertisement. Well that's an e Okay then. Away! Welcome back, self heal bunny. Uh, bunny, hope you're doing well. Yeah, goodbye, world. Yeah, exactly. I did this boss like well. I cleared it at least eight times back in Shadowbringers, uh, unsynced. Um, and we specifically used the goodbye world strategy for this. <clears throat> and the goodbye world strategy is that there is this. Akin to how... I can't... Uh, uh, there's a mechanic a little later in the fight. Um, but uh, where everyone gets, like, a few mechanics. And... It's a little bit like Alexander Savage. <coughs> A12S. Wherein, if you were only four players, you can basically ignore it unsynced. If you stand on, like, the edges of the cardinal directions. And... It's the same here. But you need... But you can only do it if you're four. So what you do is you just have the four... Usually you have the four, four DPS players jump off. And then you just have both healers, like... During the mechanic, they rest the two DPS. And then they accept the rest when the mechanic is over. And you do it right here. You just, as this is casting, all the DPS just yeet. It's really funny. You don't need to do that anymore. If you actually brought eight players for this, the boss would probably be near dead or dead right now. They could give Red Mage Flesh 2 or something? Ooh, that sounds chaotic. What if... Actually, this is a good example of how quality of life or convenience can completely break what makes a job interesting. Imagine if they gave Red Mage two charges on Flesh and Contra 6. Then the whole, oh, you have to use an exactly on cooldown would stop being relevant. It would make the job way easier, but it would also remove this particular song and dance with the job. A particular aspect of the job would just become irrelevant. Of this, like, optimal alignment of your rotation on that. Like, that would be a th an, an additional solution to the whole, Oh no, your melee combo is a, uh, has a weird janky timing. Um, because then there would just be no reason to worry about it anymore. It's the same as if they, like... Now, they're reworking Dragoon, right? So it could be something else. But if they gave Dragoon two charges on jump, then it would be it would be mean that the job wouldn't have to worry about using jump exactly on cooldown. 
They would give Red Mage an OGCD similar to Wormwind Thrust, where you get it off using 50 mana or Scorch or something. They could do that as well. <laughs> uh, that would also be interesting. You're saying Dragoon needs a double jump. I'm saying that if you gave Dragoon a double jump, it might actually make the job very boring. And yet is quite scary with uh, a rework, specifically because we've seen what reworks mean for some jobs. As you as you may recall. The goon needs more legs. Yes. You reach level 92 with Dragoon and you get a trait that says your legs are 30% tall 30% longer. And you just see like the instant your character levels up your character just goes yoink and then just like raises a foot or something and if, if, if it's a lala fail you raise like part of a foot i guess <clears throat> kazu says is tomorrow supposed to have the job action trailer is that going to be in may with the media tour i i'm not sure i'm not sure it's possible we get the uh, job action trailers in uh, it, in on the 13th, 12th, depending on where you are in the world. Um, but it's pretty funny with a lot of jobs that some jobs there is Jadalas <laughs> get stilts. Here's a fun fact, by the way. I believe in Shadowbringers, if you had like an average team this is around the time where the boss would be close to dead or dead in shadowbring like late shadowbringers like you were close enough that it was a possibility that you could finish the boss off before this stuff actually resolved It's actually an interesting thing. I've talked about this in relation to Paladin and Monk before. That monks back in Stormblood were like, we don't really need anything. You know what pa what monks got in Shadowbringers originally? In Shadowbringers, so in Stormblood, you used a an ability called Riddle of Fire, which increased the damage you did. Like it's just like a stance. And every time you did a step 3 of your combo sequence, you gained a stack of Greased Lightning, which does kind of the same thing as it does now passively. It just also made you do more damage. And you could stack up to 3, and if you didn't add to it or refresh it within 15 seconds, you would lose it. Also, by the way, well done. I am curious why you didn't just try and solo the fight when your friend died. <clears throat> but well done, Vyek. I am a little surprised that the phase two was a longer fight. Despite knowing that phase two is the harder, like, harder fight under normal circumstances. <clears throat> yeah, exactly, back when Anatman had a use case. But what they got in Shadowbringers is, well, they got Anatman, then they got an ability, <clears throat> well, they got a trait, that said, if you're in Riddle of Wind, which basically makes you run 10% faster, like Ninja's trait, then you can have four stacks of Greased Lightning. You may notice that now you just have it as a trait, that you just have four stacks. Or like, it, it is like 20% <clears throat> instead of 15, 10, or 5. That is one thing they gave Monk. That is one of the few things they could give Monk that Monks would be like, yeah, we could use that. We could use that, I guess. Because it just made what they had already slightly better. <clears throat> and then they gave them Six-Sided Star. Like, they just went... I don't know. Have this.
The same thing with Paladin. In Stormblood... No, well, we can do that first. Ymir says, then they got Masterful Blitz and Endwalker. Actually, before Shadowbringers ended, Monk got completely reworked. Um, where they made Greased Lightning passive. <clears throat> and they made Tornado Cake an OGCD. That they could just use on a 40 second cooldown or something. And then in Endwalker, they reworked that to Masterful Blitz. But the really interesting thing about this is that Monk... <clears throat> in Stormblood, didn't need anything more. Then in Shadowbringers, they gave them something anyway. And then they realized that eh, this could be better. So they re overhauled the entire job. And then they added something in Endwalker that they had now made space for. Alright, Emir, thank you for coming. For Paladin, it was a similar case. In Stormblood, the looping rotation of Paladin was one, two, three. The Goring Blade was a dot. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Right? It's so a reapply the dot. So, like, you went one, two, fight or flight, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. It requiesced, and then you did Holy Spirit five times. By the way, in Stormblood, Requiesca did not make Holy Spirit have no cast time. So you actually stood there like a caster just going... Bleh. 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 For like 12 seconds. <laughs> um, and then you went back and went 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, fight or flight 3. Paladins didn't need anything. The rotation was complete. What could you possibly give us? How about atonement? Just replace one of your one, two, three royal authorities with three atonements. Or then people discovered, well, maybe what if you only do two atonements and found out that was actually better sometimes. And then the paladins went, and also they also got confitio. Which meant they went Holy Spirit four times, then Confitio, and then they also got that Requiescat, made it so their Holy Spirit and spells in general were instant during Requiescat. That, that was nice as well, but ultimately, the additions in Shadowbringers was, now you do three Atonements, or two, instead of one of your Royal Authority combos every set. Um, and Confitio was added at the end of the Magic Burst. And the Paladins went, now we couldn't possibly need anything else. And then Endwalker came, and the pl uh, and the developers went. Do you? What could we give them? I I don't know. What what? There's no space anywhere. Could we could we like upgrade Royal Authority or something? No, there's no space for that. What what could we possibly give them? What if? What if? We make it so that when you use Confitio. It turns into three blades, and the last blade applies a dot that does not stack with Goring Blade, but is basically Goring Blade with Fight or Flight on it. So, so that it, it it's like it, it it's like instead of the Goring Blade combo, so that you just go straight to Royal Authority combo after that. Yeah. Well, it does mean that it takes the space of something that was already there, and that worked with Atonement. And that's how Paladin and Endwalker got upgraded. Everything else was just, uh, Holy Sheltron is just better Sheltron. Expiation is just upgraded spirits within. So Paladin just got a magic upgrade to their, one of their Goring Blades. And then they went, how about if Paladin isn't a dot job anymore? And just grabbed all that and threw out the window. <laughs> just, Meow. What if we upgraded Shield Bash? You know, that is actually... A good idea. I'm actually, I will say, I'm shocked. I am shocked that Shield Bash survived the rework. I'm shocked that it didn't fit. <clears throat> that it's some, that they somehow decided that it didn't get them removed. And yet that's true, Jake. The, the part of the reason why Paladin needed the rework was because Paladin was like... Paladin was from a different era of the game. Because if you compared um, 
But if you if you went back to Shadowbringers and compared Warrior, Paladin, and Dark Knight, <clears throat> then Warrior was the smash, use all cooldowns, big burst immediately. Dark Knight was the one where you just used something a little bit all the time, but then people discovered that if you like stockpile, you could burst when you have a damage bonus. And Paladin was the one that just did more damage all the time. Like, they just had, like, more f like more frequent, smaller spikes in damage, but they did very good damage all the time. Which means that you had, like, Warrior, which was like, I burst, it's it what I do. Paladin, which is like, I'm just reliable. I'm good old reliable sword and board. And Dark Knight, which is like, total chaos, because you could do whatever you want, on ultimately. <coughs> um... But it turns out that good, slightly higher sustained DPS isn't very good in Final Fantasy XIV when burst phases exist. <clears throat> Yurihin says, is the stun man maybe mandatory for Gladiator or Paladin quests at some point? I don't believe so. I don't believe so. Not at all. But, but, I... I, I don't know how many said it, but I do remember that some people, when Paladin was announced to get reworked, some people were scared that they would lose Shield Bash. There were probably like at least a dozen Paladins afraid of losing Shield Bash. Because if you're the kind of person that likes soloing stuff or doing unusual things in the game, then having a six second stun with no cooldown beyond the GCD. That's unique. The only other job that even comes close to having that is Blue Mage. They could put Shield Swipe back as is, I think. Hmm, I think that's a terrible idea. <clears throat> Let me explain. We actually talked about this earlier on the walk. What is Shield Swipe? I don't know if it was already all the way back in the Realm of Orn, but when I got into the game in Stormblood, Paladin had an action called Shield Swipe. It was an OGCD, it did mm, damage, like okay damage. It was only usable after you blocked, and I believe it had a cooldown such that when you used it, it wouldn't be available twice per block, of course. I think it was an AoE, I'm not 100% sure on that one. But that's not important. The important part is when you blocked, you could click shield swipe and get free damage. This means that in back in Stormblood, I believe Sheltron still read you block the next two attacks or something like that. But that also meant that Oath Gauge was a damage resource, technically, because blocking equal damage because shield swipe and forcing that magic to happen means more block it uh, mean means more damage they removed shield swipe in shadowbringers but at least in shadowbringers shieldtron was you block all attacks for the next four seconds and six seconds when you got enhanced Sheltron at 74. <clears throat> um, and um, if Sh Shield Swipe had stayed around for that, then again, Sheltron would obviously be a. Sheltron would be a damage cooldown in addition to defensive cooldown. So you might not want to do that. And if they added Shield Swipe back now, then Passage of Arms weaving, as in on cooldown, you w would want to weave Passage of Arms just so that you could get a free instant guaranteed block, so you could Shield Swipe, and Bulwark on cooldown, so you could get free Shield Swipes when the boss was attacking you, would both be things that Paladins would be able to and would eventually be forced to do to do competitive damage compared to the other tanks. In the same way that Scholars are almost, almost forced to use Energy Drain to keep up with damage with the other healers. 
if you can use a defensive resource for offense, then eventually it will become expected that you do. We don't want that, because that means that the defensive value of those cooldowns become meaningless. And also that bad angel, Paladin would demand that they would want to main tank everything, because then they get more blocks. Um, and consider this, they would use Bulwark for damage, so they have one less defensive cooldown, and also feel like they have to main tank with that one less cooldown, so that they get more blocks. And finally, because blocks are random, it also means that Paladin will get this random property in their attacks. The thing is, uh, Pecky, Red Panda Pecky, it would be cool if you had something happen when you block. Anything, something happen, just something. But if you make the thing that happens damage, then all of the cooldowns that interact with blocking are now the damage cooldowns instead of defensive cooldowns. Um, in Stormblood, the way that Oath Gauge generation worked was that when you were in your tank stance, uh, shield oath, whenever you blocked, you generated five oath gauge. Which of course meant that when you used Sheltron and then blocked twice, you got ten oath gauge refunded. It's pretty good. When you used Holy Spirit in shield oath, you generated twenty oath gauge. Pretty good. But because uh, Holy Spirit didn't do that great damage without Requiescat, you didn't really want to do that unless you had Requiescat up, or you had to because of range or something, to my knowledge. Also because your rotation was so strict, you didn't exactly have space for a random Holy Spirit. Um, if you were in Sword Oath, um, which was your damage stance, then your auto attacks did way more damage. Basically, they did something to the effect of double damage. And your auto attacks generated 5 Oath Gauge, which is what we have now. Um, it's a little bit of a shame that they didn't, like, maybe call that Sword Oath or something as a little bit of a callback. Upgrade Bulwark or Passage, uh, of, uh, or passage to apply a heart on successfully blocks. On successful blocks. I mean, they could do things with a successful block. But that, that is actually a good idea. Something like a heal over time effect. Could be. The problem is that it is in, like nearly uncontrollable randomness. Which is partly why it would be somewhat unsatisfying to have. Rontum says, I want a gauge generator for Paladin. Having it on auto attack isn't bad, it just feels bad. And you know what's weirdest about this? You know what's weirdest about this? Ninki used to be generated from auto attacks. I believe it was exclusively auto attacks as well. Not 100% sure on that, but it was back in Stormblood, it was auto attacks. I think they moved it to weapon skills in Shadowbringers. Can't remember if it was like initially when we came to Shadowbringers or if it was after the reworked on Injutsu that they also did that. But Ninki was uh, was originally auto attacks as well. I have no idea why they decided that Paladin stays on auto attacks. Well, I have an idea, but it may it's weird. It's just weird because Oath Gauge being generated by auto attacks means that. The cooldown on she uh, on uh, Sheltron or Holy Sheltron is actually 22.4 seconds. Because that's the amount of time it takes a paladin with, for example, this relic weapon to swing 10 times. Except this cooldown is extended if you don't have anything you can attack or if you're actively hard casting Holy Spirit or anything else for that matter. Um, see, Darth says, uh, heal over time would make a block proc feel less bad if they added something when block. They did, it's the best idea to do. Yeah, exactly. 
a heal over time effect is something where it is helpful, but it isn't. It isn't like you need the proc to happen at this exact time, or you will wipe or something. It's kind of like it's nice when it happens, but. It's okay when it doesn't happen. And sometimes you have full health, so the heart just doesn't do anything. And sometimes you get it exactly when you need it. And that's also a good point, Bad Angel, that by putting it exclusively on the guaranteed block situations, you could do that. The key thing is that if you make it so that it is any block, then you might not feel compelled to use, well, Passage of Arms to greed a heart for yourself. Although... Maybe that's not so bad. Maybe that's not so bad. But yeah, th that's the reason why I, like, with Shield Swipe, the reason why I'm, like, genuinely perky. I've been like, oh, man, if only we had Shield Swipe, and then, like, my knowledge of how people optimize jobs in Final Fantasy just, like, flies in from the side and tells me, <laughs> no, you don't want that. Like, wow, you don't want that. Like, you super don't want that. Like, absolutely not, because it would not be fun. Because I specifically, like, I see, like, like, war flashbacks of specifically Scholar being, like, optimization uh, and energy drain. The thing is, there are Scholars that like it that way. But I'm just saying that I'm, like super confident that if like because the thing is the scholars relationship with energy drain from shadowbringers was in stormblood you both summoner and scholar used ether flow to get their ether flow stacks and energy drain was a way to spend it that healed you a bit gave you some mp and did some damage like it did a little bit of everything but fester did better damage and was summoner, exclu summoner exclusive and scholar had better options to heal with right um in shadowbringers they made it so that summoners got their ether flow by using energy drain like it is now um and scholars lost energy drain as in they just took energy drain and threw out the window they're just nope that doesn't exist anymore which is the reason like it made sense because that meant scholar had ether flow and summoner had energy drain and then people complained that without energy drain what do we do when we had excess energy drains like what if i don't if what if i have energy drains to spare that I don't need... Okay, like, what if I have ether flows to spare that I don't need for healing? What do I do with those before I use ether flow? And the answer, of course, is you just don't do anything. Perhaps. But uh, the developers... Uh, uh, relinquished and let them have back energy drain. So they could use energy drain again. But I'm just saying that if Scholar didn't have energy drain... I'm reasonably confident that Broil might do, like, an extra 15 potency. Like, just ish. Potentially. Maybe even 25. Because the key here is that Sage doesn't have this. And the reason why this matters is because Sage gets that extra damage for free because they can't spend their resources on damage like that. Scholar has to sacrifice healing to get this kind of damage. But Scholar has the option to do that and Sage doesn't. Like that's the diff that's the difference. Yeah, exactly, Pecky. It is worth considering that a huge part of the player base that is often one that we might forget in these kind of discussions do not care about all this optimization shenanigans like as in they really do not care and they might not even realize or notice that all this is happening in the background like if you're just playing the game and you're not looking up all these guides, you might not you might not ever realize that there's this whole two-minute burst meta. Um 
And it's also how you have tanks at max level that might not even realize that there is such a thing as a positional. Because they've never played a melee job or something. Um, and these players might not have any negative feelings towards getting shield swipe. If they got shield swipe, they might just be like, Oh, wow, nice! I blocked and then I get damage! That's awesome! And that would be the end of it. And it's just like in the really like super sweaty mega optimizers perspective that it becomes a problem. Because honestly, if I was paladin in like a dungeon, maybe even an extreme, maybe even in savage, it would take a bit to make me actually go and use bulwark for damage. Because Consider that I gave this whole spiel that in Stormblood you had shield swipe and you could use Shieldron to like force that to proc. I played Paladin a lot in Stormblood and I never did that. Like I used Shieldron when I needed to or felt like I needed to. And then I used shield swipe because I got it. But I didn't waste those defensive resources. Kazo says, I actually realized that my greedy self likes Sage more because I don't feel pre uh, pressed to use energy drain for damage on Sage and run out of all my healing. You can get more greedy because you have all those extra defensive cooldown options. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what is best. I'm just like, when, when we have discussions like this, like for example, Shield Swipe, I can see far enough ahead to like picture what the optimizers will do but I honestly I don't know how much that matters don't know how much we care honestly know what I mean don't know how much we actually care about that because that is actually an interesting point um, and that is also something that circles back to things we've talked about with like Summoner and like people being mad that it be got was made easy. Um, is that and this is like I've talked about this a little bit before that if you have a job that is like so difficult to play that uh, that it has very few players playing it, <clears throat> then if you rework it. And the aftershock is that there are now more players playing it. And that's a success, right? In the same way that if Paladin got shield swipe back, right? The Savage Raiders that are like the... The, the thing is, the sweatiest tryhard Savage Raiders would play Paladin anyway if Paladin turned out to be the best option. And they would just do that. And they would just work around that. Then there would be the stalwart paladin mains that might not like that they have to play this way, but they might do that anyway, or they might just choose to defiantly not do it. Uh, the rest of the players, for the most part, will just deal with it, right? They'll just deal with it, and some might find it fun, some might not, and if the net end result is there are now more people playing paladin, or alternatively, the pa people that are playing Paladin are having more fun. Net gain. It's just really difficult to calculate, like, like to get these numbers on these things. And that, that is also a very important thing with Dragoon. I, 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 agree, I agree on that one, Darth. Dragoon would be the job that you would pike. If any job, that would be the one that you pike. Actually. <laughs> um, but that is an interesting point, Bad Angel. Consider this. What... Is it that makes Dragoon fun? 
Is it the amount of buttons you press? Like in your burst? Or... Is it specifically stacking all those cooldowns and then pressing a lot of buttons? Because if the thing that is fun about Dragoon is using a lot, like your burst comes up and you're just like just mashing buttons, right? They can rework Dragoon and that still be the case. Like, you can do that. Like, I'm pretty sure that if they toned down the impact of the two-minute burst, right? Just in general, so that it is a bit less crucial to do perfectly. And they replaced Lance Charge and Dragon Sight. You keep Battle Litany, but they replaced Lance Charge and Dragon Sight with more OGZD attacks. Then you would have more, more blah, 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 to play with, right? You would get more of that. And now it would be much less of, of like, oh, I need to do this and this and this. Like, I have to set up all of my buffs. Um, but you would still have the mash, 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 mash. You would still have that. If that's what makes Dragoon fun. I don't... Like, see, the thing is, I don't main Dragoon. I never have. I... Like, Dragoon is actually ranked very low in terms of, like, jobs that I enjoy. Um, but that's why I'm saying, what makes Dragoon fun? And what I've seen more and more is that a lot of people... Um, ...often emphasize the, oh, there's so many buttons to press in the burst. That is an interesting suggestion, Perky. And if you... I don't know if 20 stacks is maybe a bit on the high side, but... Oh, that... that now, this is an idea. This is an idea. There was one thing people... Wa that Paladins wanted when the rework idea came up. And that was something that people... That Paladin main still wanted after the rework. Mainly, paladins that really, really liked atonement dropping, which is an, a subject I've talked about a few times. A button that spends the remaining atonement stacks you have for like a bigger burst or something, so that you can choose to do atonement three times, or you can just do one and then just spend the rest, um, so that you can like... So that you can optimize and perfect the timing of your burst to your fight or flight and all that. And like your combo sequence and all that. What if... In Dawn Trail... They make it so that when you have atonement stacks... Shield Bash turns into Holy Shield Bash. And it does damage... Uh, extra damage based on atonement stacks. <coughs> And the key here is that they make it so that those atonement stacks, like, Holy Shield Bash is not better than actually using atonement three times. But it can be situationally better, like, to align your burst and things like that. But while we're at it, they could make it so that each time you block, you get, like, a stacking buff that makes Holy Shield Bash do a little bit more damage. Like, like one percent or something. It's like when you reach twenty, like maybe it caps at twenty stacks. Holy Shield Bash actually is better than using Atonement three times. So like this Atonement, quote unquote, dropping concept comes back into Paladin. It's like you would actually want to do that sometimes, but because the buff from blocking is so minuscule and small. It doesn't matter that much if you, like, you need a lot of blocks for it to really matter and you might want to use this Holy Shield Bash more than once per minute 
Or maybe you'll use it more than once for two minutes, and maybe it's actually difficult to reach the maximum stack count. So you could do like that could be something you could give them and that would be something new and it would also mean that shield bash now has a reason to return to the hotbar if you really want to mess with paladins because a lot of paladins have actually removed shield bash from the hotbars you make it a, a trait that you get at like level 60 or something so like all the paladins when dawn trail comes out they already have it <laughs> and they don't even realize <clears throat> that says what would make Dragoon fun for me is long GZ abilities with super elaborate jump animations but they have to fit everything into 2.5 seconds yeah see that's the thing I think I've said that at myself as well I, I actually have said that a few times is that um, the thing I think would be really cool is if they made the Dragoon jumps GZDs and the reason why I think it would be cool if they made the jumps GZDs is because one, the jumps would be allowed to do way more damage because they're taking up a whole GZD. Two, these jumps would now be allowed to do a bit more. Like they would be actually be allowed to take up a little bit more time. Like imagine if they made Star Diver do Double the damage, like they, it does the same. It would do the same damage, like it would be rivaling Aflato's misery in damage. But it's a GCD, and for the full GCD, you can't do anything else. Like the full 2.5 seconds you're spending on Star Diver, you might say that's still very short. Yes, but Star Diver's full animation plays in 1.5 seconds. Let's see. Uh, Bad Angel says the fun thing about Dragoon is you're always doing something in that cl class. 30 seconds, 60 seconds, and 120 seconds you have something. Worm went outside a window. And you also have live search. Like, yeah, I, I can see that. And they could do that. Like, if they... Like, the thing is, the problem with a job doing something all the time is that with the two-minute burst, the job still has to, like, culminate in the biggest thing it does every two minutes but if they tone down the impact of the two minute burst makes bursting a little bit less crucial maybe make it so that dragoon itself doesn't have three buffs maybe just one like maybe just battle litany then the biggest peak on the dragoon rotation might be smaller but that means that there's space to make the rest of it more impactful which means that you could have something more impactful happen all the time. And you know, Craig and Mo, you know what the ironic thing about Estinian being a Dragoon is? Dragoon being this big-brained where you have to do all this planning ahead and like timing of cooldowns meanwhile Estinian is like the meathead of the entire like main cast right <laughs> he's the meathead that just goes star driver blah. can i smack it no I'll, I'll i'll be over in the corner until there's something i can smash got it Estinian. I and mean, it's pretty funny he, he's just the me smash kind of guy. Yeah, and Estinian cheats. Let's not forget that uh, you w in Shadowbringers, we went, Wow, we have Star Diver, that's awesome. And then in the final solo duty of Shadowbringers, Estinian is like, Would you like to see me do eight Star Divers immediately on top of each other? At, no, not on top of each other, but at the same time. Eight, <laughs> and then he did it. <laughs> I 
And yeah, they they could they could do that, Gazo. Like they, they could they could they could give Dragoon some bigger actions. Part of the problem I think with doing something like that is that Dragoon is like We've talked about this before. The jobs that have been getting like targeted with reworks recently. Summoner, Paladin, Monk. Um They've been also ninja. Like, if we go back to Shadowbringers, Machinist got reworked. And Ninja got an overhaul in some aspects. Monk got aspect, like, changes. Dark Knight got changes. Major, like, a full overhaul for Dark Knight, by the way. All of these jobs are jobs that originally, like, they originated from A Realm Reborn or Heavensward. As in, the design of the job, the way the job worked, originated from A Realm Reborn or Heavensward. And Stormblood added the job gauge. Which means that all of these jobs were, like, made to fit in the job gauge world already. And then Shadowbringers, they made some other changes. And, like, as the game has grown, these jobs have, like, just gotten more and more stuff added on top and maybe it just doesn't fit with the game anymore and then they rework it just throw it out try again um, and dragoon though like the one thing that has ch the, the thing that has changed about this right the thing that has changed about this since realm reborn is that they used to have a uh, um they had two step one combos. I believe the other one was called Power Drive or something. Impulse Drive. And then they had Heavy uh, heavy Thrust. Impulse Drive did more damage than True Thrust. This actually reached, lead, led to a really hilarious situation. Where when you unlocked Impulse Drive at like level 4. Just spamming Impulse Drive was better than this combo until you got full thrust which meant that like your rotation was basically just impulse drive disembowel impulse drive on average really silly anyway impulse that of course meant that in heaven sword your rotation hypothetically was impulse drive disembowel chaos, chaos thrust wheeling thrust True Thrust, Warble Thrust, Heaven Thrust, Fang and Claw. And then I don't know if you did that again and then the other one. But that was a hypothetical combo. Except you also had Heavy Thrust. Heavy Thrust was the thing that actually gave you the damage bonus that Disembowel gives now. Back then, Disembowel applied a Piercing Resistance debuff that made Piercing Attacks do more damage. Who does Piercing damage? Dragoon. Bath and Machinist, and only Dragoon could apply this debuff, <clears throat> which was very overpowered in a way. But that meant that your rotation in Stormblood was like Heavy Thrust, Impulse Drive combo, the full five steps, Heavy Thrust combo, the full five steps, Heavy Thrust, and then back again. It's like, bing, nyom, nyom, bing, nyom, nyom. And the only changes, as you can see to this, is they removed Heavy Thrust. And they removed Impulse Drive. But the rest is here. They've built on this since A Realm Reborn. So if there's one thing that might really be in danger, it might actually be that. Genuinely. It might be the, fi the two five-step combos that are on the chopping block. Because that's the one of the oldest parts of the job that hasn't really gotten that much change. <laughs> the value of only doing one job instead of a dozen, I suppose. Oh, is that what the problem is? The reason why when we take control of the science in quests, their like their to tools are super simple, is because they've just mastered their role so much that they're like. I don't need all of this other stuff. And then they've just gotten really good at using those five buttons and nothing else. But, um... Anything is possible. So if you're a Dragoon main, don't... <coughs> don't, uh... Get sad in advance, right? 
Take it when it comes. However, let me put it like this. I was a summoner main in Shadowbringers. And I was basically resigned to go, well, I'm probably playing summoner anyway. It turned out that I really liked the rework of summoner, so I didn't mind. But I was kind of resigned to be like, well, I don't, like, it doesn't matter what they do to the job. I'm probably playing summoner anyway for Endwalker. I had already decided that. So I didn't need to worry about that. But if you're in the mindset that if Dragoon is changed in so-and-so way, then I don't want to play it, then it might not be a bad idea to, like, figure out what your secondary is. Like, if Dragoon turns out to be mega boring and you hate it, then it's pretty good to have already figured out what your secondary choice is. But there's only so much you can do because... Remember this. Which jobs were we told were getting o o reworked with Endwalker? Which jobs were we told got reworked with Endwalker when they were going to end release Endwalker? I believe it was Summoner, right? Just Summoner, right? Because, personally, Monk's Masterful Blitz is such an impactful change to the rotation that I'd argue that that qualifies as a rework. Um, the reason being that in Stormblood and Shadowbringers, the way Monk worked was that Monk, like, Monk got things like Riddle of Fire, like, big damage buffs and stuff. But the way the job actually worked was that it was just really good at a filler rotation. And then just using OGCDs on cooldown. And that was Monk. You just did really high consistent damage by just punching really fast and really hard. That was what you did. And that was also true in Shadowbringers. When they f removed Greased Lightning as a thing to maintain, they made it so, like, Tornado Kick before that rework ate all of your Greased Lightning stacks as a big hit, and then you had to, like, build back up to it, right? Which you could use Perfect Balance for. But because of Masterful Blitz, while Monk is still, you just hit really hard and really fast, as Jake says, it has more of, like, peaks with the perfect balance where you're like um where you burst with these explosive finishers which were not part of the rotation before it is worth pointing out that before stormblood monk had other gzds that they could use that didn't actually push their form forward uh, they had a, a debuff like a dot they could apply called touch of death which did basically no damage, and then applied a mega mean dot to the target, and it caused a lot of TP to use, but it did not push your form forward. And I believe back then, Greased Lightning lasted 10 seconds even? Which meant that you had to like go through your 1, 2, 3 combos and make sure that that kept, like, kept spinning, but in between that, you had other things to use that you also needed to maintain. Um, but they removed that and went, nope, we're just focusing, uh, focusing on the Greased Lightning stuff for Stormblood and Onward. That's it. That's all we're doing. Um, so, Masterful Blitz is also like a step away from that. But that wasn't really something we emphasized that much. What I mean, what I'm trying to get at here is in Dawn Trail, we know that we're getting Viper and, Astro uh, and, Viper and Pictomancer. And we know that Dragoon and Astrologing are getting reworked. But we also know that anything is possible. It is a possibility that Dawn Trail comes out and uh, now they've decided that Scholar doesn't have a pet anymore. And Summoner doesn't have a pet either. 
and we get Beastmaster. <laughs> and they, they, they just release Beastmaster. Psych, it's actually a normal job. We, we, we finally got the pet system to work or something. Like, anything is possible. They might overhaul a job that they didn't even mention. Because the change they decided to make was just not significant enough for them to, like, mention it. Like, they just go, well, I mean, we did change it, but... Like, it's not that bad, is it? Like, we didn't do that much. Um, like they did with Monk and Endwalker. Because they, they just... Like, they they just... They removed Tornado Cake as an OGCD. Which it was before. Like, in the... After Shadowbringer's rework of Monk. Before Endwalker change of Monk. Um, Tornado Cake was, a, I believe, a 40 second OGCD. That just did single target damage. They removed that and then gave you Masterful Blitz. And that's also a true game in him. Back in Stormblood... Actually, back in Stormblood days, Riddle of Fire forced your character into the Fists of Fire state, which you want to be in anyway, made you do like 30% more damage, and then slowed your GCD so you actually had like something akin to a normal GCD compared to other jobs. Um, and this is actually also a thing with uh, the other ones. Is that um, in Stormblood, you had elemental shoulder tackles. By the way, shoulder tag was an OGCD that monks used to have, which was a gap close that did damage. They removed that and gave you Thunderclap in Endwalker. Um, in Stormblood, depending on which which elemental fist you had, you had a different um, shoulder tackle. And Riddle of Fire was, of course, a damage buff that also slowed your GCD. Riddle of Earth was a defensive cooldown, which forced you into Fist of Stone, which reduced the damage you took by 10%. And Riddle of Wind was shoulder tackle. As in, if you were in Riddle of Fire, then your shoulder tackle did more damage. If you were in Riddle of Stone, or R Riddle of Earth, then I believe your shoulder tackle had a knockback component or something weird like that. If you were in Fists of Wind, then shoulder tackle had two casts, like a combo. Because the second hit was Riddle of Wind. But the weird thing is that uh, shoulder tackle plus Riddle of Wind did the same damage as the fire tackle. So, and Fists of Fire gave you a bonus damage. So I don't know why you would ever do that. Like why you would use Riddle of Wind the, uh, when you could just use fire, fire tackle. And you might be thinking, but wait, didn't you say that the Greased Lightning thing in Shadowbringers and Fist of Wind are like f three hours ago? Yes, but they removed the elemental tackles with Shadowbringers. <laughs> so that's, um, Monk has been through a lot. But my point is, anything is possible. So while you might be like, steadfast this is the job i'm going to play it is always not a bad idea to have like a secondary or third if if the job that you really wanted doesn't turn out to be the way that you wanted it and um, personally me personally uh, if, if anyone's curious uh, i'm not sure which role i want to play right at the start of dawn trail but I might... Like, if I'm playing tank, I'm probably playing warrior at first. If I'm playing healer, I'm probably playing sage. And if I'm playing DPS, I'm probably going summoner again. Which, of course, means I also get scholar. And the weird thing about that is that when I look at all these DPS jobs we have, I'm thinking, well, I, I really don't want to be black mage in this content I've never seen before. I'll just be too focused on my rotation. Red Mage is nice, but actually, I feel like if I'd rather summoner if we're going Mage, and like I'm just going through all that with a lot of the jobs where I'm thinking, what would they add? Like I have a feeling that if I'm ch if I choose Red Mage, I'll just get Endwalker Red Mage, like more of that, which is fine. 
And I have the same feeling about most of the melee and like ranged physical jobs that I, I don't really look forward to anything special for them. But Summoner is so extremely bare bones at this moment, honestly, that there's space there. I'm I, like, I hope they add something really cool. Also makes it so if I keep playing Monk, eventually I'll grow six fists like Sephiroth and be the ultimate puncher. <laughs> that would be cool. Um, but that that's kind of what I'm thinking. Um, but I'm not sure. Part of the reason why I'm leaning towards not going DPS for the very start is because... Well, I'll, first of all, I'll probably be streaming my playthrough of Dawn Trail. But... A lot of people are going to be playing Viper and Pictomancer. So if I choose my first job to be a DPS, I'll have giga long queues. Like insanely long queues for stuff. I'll have to do it with duty support. Or with you guys. But you probably also want to play Viper and Pictomancer, like a bunch of you. So it probably makes more sense for me to go tank a healer. And now that like that 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 like sort of shrinks in my options the way i'm going to do it and i have suggested this before is that i'm going to unlock viper and pictomancer and i'm going to spend some wondrous tales on one of them and i'll probably use my like my daily roulettes as best i can if i can on them to like catch them up and i am more excited for viper than pictomancer personally but i'm not going to try to use them for the dawn trailer msq I'm just not. Um, but yeah, I I am not sure if we have job action trailers in, like tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, depending on where you are in the world. But it's possible. I recall when they uh. Uh, the most recent one, they like they were asked for job action trailers and were like they're not ready yet. So maybe they're ready now. With that said. We got through some clips, got through a, a mix of clips. Uh, we still have some, some, some a little bit, a little bit here and there, a little bit here and there. Um. Uh. That's good. Jake says traditionally not until closer to launch. I suppose not. I. I feel like I remember that the Endwalker job action trailer was like a month before. Um, something like that. Which of course meant that it was a month and a half before because of the delay. Um, but we can hope. Maybe they'll show us something. Maybe they'll show us something. Do you think Viper's gonna have a movement a move speed passive like Ninja? hard to say if they go any any way like they've done with uh like the closest we have to any precedent for this kind of stuff pecky is samurai has very little in common with monk like job wise the closest we get is they both have a damage buff and they used to both have a speed buff of some sort in like attack speed buff now it's just samurai and monk gets it gets it passively how about Reaper and Dragoon? It's not that much in common, is there? Is there? So it could go either way. Anyway, if you enjoyed the company of the wonderful people in the chat, or me, remember that there's a Discord community server that you can join where you will find, I'm pretty sure most of the people in the chat, you'll also find me. You'll also find the weekly schedule where you can see what else is coming up on the channel this week. Um, I usually update it Sunday or Monday. Um, I believe we have more... Uh, yep, we have uh, Mythbusters tomorrow. Um, you can also see the announcement room where I put links to videos or streams when they come up. So you can find them easily there if the YouTube algorithm doesn't exactly favor sharing my content with you on time. Uh, there's also the... If you go to the role assignments room, you can grab the reminders role. And if you do, you get an extra noti like a notification on Discord whenever I post a video or a stream. And you get an extra one around 15 minutes before stream starts. So you can catch it right at the start. Um, and if you enjoyed this particular stream, it helps me a lot if you leave a like on it in the YouTube system. 
um, that tells the U YouTube algorithm that this was a very enjoyable stream and you would like other people to enjoy it as well. Uh, I've heard that with the new layout that has been um, brought up for some people, like some people have got it. If you're on a PC and you literally can't see the like button, click the cinematic mode button in the, f in the video itself the like button should appear down there alongside a bunch of other things like the description um and then you can just switch it back to standard or full screen or whatever you use but it should appear if you're in cinematic mode um yeah if you want to support the channel even more directly you can also become a member you can gift memberships you can use the super chat system uh, if you don't want to use the youtube uh, approach there's also a ko-fi link in the description all of this is entirely optional there's all the videos on the channel are freely accessible for everyone, so it's of course just if you'd like to support me. And it's very appreciated and it helps me a lot, naturally. Um, but I don't want anyone to feel obligated to do it. But thank you so much for all the support that you've given me. Uh, regardless of how much it is. I really do appreciate it. Now, uh, we found the, the flower patch at the end of the universe once again. And I think this is the, the, a great time to stop. Uh, we went nearly two hours longer than I planned. But then again, I planned to go longer to make space for some clips. Um, and we did get some clips and a lot of good talks. I think we'll do it like this. Looking forward with a walk and then some clips. I think that's more fun. Means there's a little bit more to engage with in a way. There's the fun of finding the, the path as we go as well. But with that said, good night, good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are in the world. And I hope to see you all very soon. Bye-bye.